Um, well, again, thank you all for joining us. Um, we're really excited to have you here. We have a really robust lineup, so I wanted to get it started right away. Um, and um, if you need anything, just holler. And I'm going to actually pass it over to um, Nancy Herlin. Um, and um, she'll say a few words before we get started. So thanks again, everyone, for coming, and hope you enjoy the, the event. I'm the opposite. I'm very tall. <laughs> so as Lindsay said, I'm Nancy Herlin. I am the co-founder and chairman of the board of the Neuropathy Alliance of Texas. And we are partnering with the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy on this conference. And we're very excited that you're all here today. I wanted to welcome you. And I wanted to say a couple words and wasn't quite sure what I wanted to say. And yesterday, I ran into an article that said it for me. And it was entitled, 17 Pieces of Advice People with Chronic Illness, People Who Have Neuropathy, Would Give to Someone Newly Diagnosed. And it was such excellent advice, I thought, I'm going to read you just two of them. I'm not going to read you all 17, don't worry. Two of them. Number four was find people in similar situations. You will adapt and find new ways of doing things, but you must be kind to yourself on bad days. Also, find others like you in support groups. Once you've found your tribe, life will be easier. Another comment was reach out to local support groups and national organizations for resources. And include in your support system others with the same illness. Having loved ones who support you is crucial, but having loved ones who can truly relate to what you're going through makes all the difference. And number six, Figure out what works for you. Read everything and listen to everything, but choose your own path. Choose what works for you and take your time with this. Be patient and don't let others decide for you. Know that you are enough, you are valuable, just as who you are, just who you are. It's okay not to feel okay. It's not going to be easy. That might seem obvious with the physical changes that you might encounter, but it's not just that. Take time, take all the time you need to readjust and try to remember through it all, life throws curveballs of different types and strengths at everyone. This just happens to be yours. But you're strong enough to handle it and hopefully one day you'll be able to live your best life and in the meantime, make the best of what you can do. So all I wanted to say was to congratulate all of you for showing up today because you have found the importance of finding education and support and being around people who understand what you're going through. And Neuropathy Alliance of Texas exists just for that. We're here to connect you. We're an alliance of patients and caregivers and healthcare providers and those who care about those who have neuropathy. And so we're here to connect you with others who have neuropathy and with resources that will help you along your way. So if you haven't already, stop by our table and sign up so you can continue to be connected and know what's going on right here in the Central Texas area as well as Houston. And enjoy the conference. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Sarah Austin, and she'll be presenting today on the clinical trials for treatment of neuropathy. Dr. Sarah Austin is a board-certified neurologist practicing neuromuscular medicine in Austin, Texas. She is a native Texan, attending Texas A&M for undergraduate studies and the University of Texas Medical Branch for her medical education. Since finishing her residency at USC in Southern California, she completed a fellowship and stayed on faculty for three years at UTHSC Houston and then moved to Austin in 1995. She has two professional passions, caring for patients with neuromuscular disease and public policy and advocacy for organized medicine. She is the past president of the Texas Neurological Society in 2014, served as a this public policy fellow in 20, 2007 and 2008 in the US Senate served on the Council on Legislation for 47,000 
member Texas Medical Association and served on the Government Relations Committee for the AAN, both for six years. She recently finished being the president of the Travis County Medical Society. She owned her practice for 13 years and is employed by Ascension Medical Group Seton Hospital for the past four years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Austin. I have to admit, I like sitting at the head of the table, but I'm, I'm not that big of a speaker, and I'm not very good at electronics, so forgive me if I screw it. Will you leave that on here for a second? And then I'll go back. Anyway, thank you very much for having me here. I've been part of the Neuropathy Alliance, or Hands, Feet, and Heart, since it got started, I don't know how many years ago? But nine years, I was gonna say 10 years ago. Anyway, it's been my pleasure. It's been a great thing for me. Um, I've learned a lot, I've met a lot of people, and I'm just really impressed how it's um, been organized and run, and it keeps growing, which I think is great. I would, I would leave this slide up just for a second, because I wanna thank our sponsors. We're very grateful to the um, sponsors that we have today. They make all this possible. I wanna say a little bit about Almalam. It, um, it makes a drug called um, Patro or Patisseran. It's a new treatment, relatively new treatment for hereditary amyloid. And um, back when I was just in Houston, I had just finished my fellowship. I had a guy that had this horrible neuropathy and actually um, died of heart disease. And we finally figured out what he had. There was no treatment. And all that happened in probably four or five years. So um, Patro has really changed the landscape um, for this. And because Alan Lamb is sponsoring genetic testing for a lot of people with neuropathy, um, it enables me to test a lot of my patients in clinic. And so I'm grateful to them for, for doing that. Um, Regenesis is a company that um, is more of a local, localized treatment, I guess. It uses electromagnetic fields. Um, you never know what's going to work. Um, and it wouldn't hurt you, and I, I think it's, it's a great thing to try. And then the peripheral EX is these therapeutic nanobubbles. So one of the theories, and we'll talk a little bit about this with, um, uh, with diabetic neuropathy, is that the blood flow is not good to the nerves. And so this tries to increase the oxygen to the nerves that don't have enough blood flow, and that's sort of the theory. So anyway, again, we're very grateful to our sponsors. So let me see if I can find my slideshow. No, I'm sure. <laughs> The other thing is my notes don't show up on this thing. So I've got my own computer down here and the notes are like really tiny and I can't really see them very well. So if I stumble around a little bit, forgive me. Oh, now I can, oh, there they go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, now I'm probably better with it like this. All right, so I'm a neurologist practicing in Austin. I'm assistant professor at the Dell Medical School, which has been quite a fun thing to be part of for the past um, couple of years, but I'm basically employed by Seton and um, see patients in clinic, so. This is just a quick review. When you're a neurologist, our biggest deal is to localize where the lesion is. And so there's the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and then there's the peripheral nervous system, which is the nerves coming out of your neck and low back and going down your arms and legs. And obviously that's what we're talking about today. This is just a quick diagram of the motor and sensory nerves. Oh yeah. So this is the motor neuron. The nerve cell body right here sits in your spinal cord. And then there's this big old long tail that comes all the way down from your low back. It would go all the way down your leg to the tip of your toes. And it goes to the muscles here. There's the axon, which is the wire itself. And then there's the myelin, which is the insulation around the wire. In the peripheral nervous system, the insulation is made by swan cells. In the central nervous system, it's made by a different cell called an oligodendrocyte. So the impulses go from the cell body down this way. In contrast, this is a sensory neuron. So the impulses come from the little sensory organelles in your skin on your fingertips, and the impulse goes up the axon. Again, it's surrounded by a myelin, and it tends to be a bipolar neuron. So the cell body actually sits outside of the spinal cord right before it goes into the spinal cord. So when you talk about neuropathy, you can talk about a sensory motor neuropathy, which is the most common thing. So the sensory nerves and the motor nerves are involved. You'll get weakness, numbness, trouble with balance, that kind of thing. 
Um, if it's a pure motor neuropathy, you only get weakness. And the classic pure motor neuropathy would be amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which sort of falls into a different category than what we're talking about here. Um, most of our neuropathies are either pure sensory and they can be large fiber, which means that your balance is off because when you think about it, you have to know where your weight is on your feet to be able to keep your balance. And if you lose that sensation, it makes it very hard to balance, especially in the dark. And then there's these small fiber neuropathies. Those are the pain and temperature nerves. And when they get damaged, they do two things. One is they, uh oh, that's not me, okay. okay. One is they take away the pain, these small fiber neuropathies, so you can't feel pain, which is not a good thing because if you cut your feet, you won't know to take care of it. And the second thing is they tend to fire when they're not supposed to, and so it becomes very painful. It can be a really painful neuropathy. There's a bunch of different potential causes for neuropathy, and this list is not complete, obviously. I used to think, I used to tell people it's three pages of fine print in my textbooks that can cause neuropathy. Lots and lots of things cause neuropathy. Um, today, we're just gonna talk about these four. So diabetic neuropathies, hereditary neuropathies, um, chemotherapy-induced neuropathies, and then CIDP. Um, I picked the subjects that we're gonna talk about today just sort of at random. They're completely subjective. I liked them and thought they were interesting and so I pulled them out. So uh, anyway, I, it's not an inclusive list. There's a lot of uh, research going on in neuropathy right now. And this is just the things that I thought was interesting. So, so you're stuck with that. So there's two focuses for the treatment of neuropathy. And my patients ask me this all the time. One is, how do you treat the underlying neuropathy, the cause? And the, the analogy be, would be if you had a sinusitis, you take antibiotics, it cures the sinusitis and it's gone. That would be great. Um, we don't have any magical cures right now for neuropathy, at least that I can think of, that really do that. Um, but the other treatment is for the symptoms, which is usually pain or weakness. And so we sort of focus on both, and the, the experimental trials that are going on for neuropathy focus on both. Some of them are trying to cure the disease. Some of them are trying to treat the symptom. This is a trial that I was part of a couple of years ago, ended a couple of years ago, and I wanted to bring it up for a couple of reasons. It's a real-life um, situation pain control trial. There were about... 30 sites or more across the country that participated. We picked four drugs, or they picked four drugs to try. They're all um, sort of common drugs that we use all the time. Um, nortriptyline is, whoops. Nortriptyline is Pamelor. It's an old antidepressant medicine. We know that it works on pain. Um, duloxetine is Cymbalta, the generic for Cymbalta. It also is an antidepressant medicine that works on pain. The third one was pregabalin, which is Lyrica. And the fourth one was mixilatine, which is a heart medicine, which is a sodium channel blocker. So it was kind of the dark horse um, in the group, not something that we normally use, although I've gotten to where I try it more. So everybody was randomized to one of these four drugs. And so when you sign up for the trial, they randomize you right away. And then you, I hand you a prescription and you go get it filled. And so all they wanted to know was, did you stay on the drug and did it help? And for any reason, if you drop the medicine, then it would count as a negative against the medicine. So it wasn't always that you couldn't tolerate it. Sometimes it was that you couldn't afford it. Back when um, duloxetine was just brand new generic, it was pretty expensive and a lot of people couldn't afford it. Lyrica or pregabalin just went generic. And so it was pretty expensive. So it kind of looked at real life reasons that people didn't get off. And so I'm going to show you the results of the trial. It's for two reasons. One is to show you what won. And two is to show you how bad the results were overall. And this is a little bit hard to see, but what is it? week 12 outcome for efficacious and non-quit. That means that they, the people thought it worked and it was effective. 25% of the people had um, relief with these medicines. And it turned out the winners were nortriptyline and Cymbalta. They worked better than mixilatine or Lyrica. But, um, but I just, I bring that up because we're talking 25%. So when somebody, like I hand my patients a prescription and say, this will help with your pain. Well, if you're lucky, you know, cause you're talking, yeah. Is nortriptyline a sister of amitriptyline? 
Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's a little easier to take because it doesn't make your mouth as dry. It doesn't make you sleepy. But it's almost the same drug. So anyway, so that's, that's that trial. That's been completed. So I went to clinicaltrials.gov. I encourage you guys to go there if you're looking for trials. It's a website. It's just clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I think the federal government must pay for it to be updated all the time, but if you have a trial going on and it's funded by the federal government, it's in there, and if you want your trial advertised, you can put it in there. And so it's a great place for patients to look. And you can do all kinds of filters, like what state, what town, all that kind of stuff. So there's 263 trials that are recruiting or plan to recruit soon on peripheral neuropathy in the U.S. So I just searched for peripheral neuropathy in the United States. And there's 48 trials that are um, advertising in Texas. So these are probably the same trials. It just, oops. Anyway, it just selects them out to be in Texas. So there's a whole bunch of trials on chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And it's not because it's chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. They pick that topic because when you have chemotherapy, they know what the natural history is. They know how many people are estimated to get neuropathy. And so it's a great thing to try, to do a trial on, because you're taking a select population who are predicted to get neuropathy and trying to avert it. And so that's why they do all these trials on chemo. Uh-huh. Neuropathy often goes away about 80% of the time, maybe more. It, sometimes it, they call it coasting. It'll get worse after you finish the chemo for a little bit, and then it usually plateaus, and most of the time it gets better, but uh, no promises. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, this intraneural facilitation, is a they're doing a trial on that. It's a technique developed by physical therapists at Loma Linda, and it has to do with stretching and positioning of the limb. They think that it increases the blood flow. And maybe it helps neuropathy, and so there's an active trial going on with that. Um, they're doing trials on dextromethorphan, which is cough syrup, basically. They use it a lot for neurologic disease. There's a drug called Nudexa that mixes dextromethorphan and quinidine and helps with pseudobulbar palsy. So, so it's been around for a long time. It's kind of interesting that they're trying that. Um, Candesartan is a blood pressure medicine. I don't know why they think that might work for neuropathy with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but somebody's trying it. N-acetylcysteine is a, is a supplement that you can get at the health food store. Um, somebody's trying Riluzole. Riluzole is a medicine that we use for ALS, and it's thought maybe it's a little bit neuroprotective. Um, in the prevention of, again, oxaliplatinum induced peripheral neuropathy. And then they're trying yoga. I mean, there's like trials on the book for yoga, the results aren't out yet. And then I thought this last one, this whole exome sequencing, I thought that was probably the most interesting one. They are uh, measuring or testing people's DNA to see if they have any variants that might predispose them toward neuropathy. And I think that's, I think the whole genetics and neuropathy thing is where it's going to be at for a while. And, um, and that's just an example of that. So you can't really talk in Texas without talking about CBD. Um, I was part of the legislative process that got it approved, or it got increased in Texas um, this year. So there's a trial for um, taxane-induced peripheral neuropathy. That's Taxol that women often get for breast cancer. There's a trial of CBD oil. Um, I'll tell you a little bit. Oh, wait, hold on. I don't know if y'all know very much about CBD. I'll talk about it for a second if you're interested, because I, I, it's pretty interesting. I didn't know all this either, but it all comes from the marijuana or the hemp plant. And marijuana has two active components. One is THC, which is a psychoactive component. It's the one that makes you high. And then there's CBD oil, which has some medical benefit, they think, but is not very psychoactive. And so about four years ago, Texas passed a law that enabled um, two doctors to sign for CBD oil that was made by special pharmacies um, to treat kids with epilepsy, basically. And, um, and it's low THC, it's not zero THC, so it's like 0.3% THC or something, and the companies that make it measure it you know, very carefully. Um, hemp, 
which is another form of marijuana plant, makes a lot of, makes CBD, but it doesn't have any THC in it. And so what Texas did this year is they legalized hemp, which means you can make a lot of CBD from that. Anyway, um, and then they uh, broadened the restrictions on what could be treated with CBD oil with a little bit of THC. So instead of just epilepsy now, now doctors, one doctor can sign an order for CBD oil with a little THC in it, and you can use it to treat spasticity and end-stage cancer and autism and I, I can't remember the other ones, but, but the big one was neurodegenerative disease. And so, and they haven't defined what neurodegenerative diseases they're talking about yet, but um, I guess we'll find out. There was a lot of debate about including painful peripheral neuropathies in this, and I think the legislature just wasn't ready to, to open the box that big um, yet. So, anyway, I don't know if CBD oil works. I don't think that it hurts you. I mean, you buy it at the CBD formulary. I saw one, there's one off of Cornavaca. I mean, I think they're, they're going to be everywhere, and, you know, who knows. Um, historically, there's not been a lot of studies done in the United States on CBD oil because it is still federally illegal. And so you have to um, get a special permit to be able to do studies. There's been a lot of studies in Europe. Um, so any questions about that? Go ahead. Do they talk about ingesting the oil or rubbing the oil or both? I think both. I have a patient with a painful neuropathy, and he learned how to make the oil a long time ago. I mean, he had some kind of way that he, you know, and he said it really helped. He did like three drops at night before he went to bed. He thought it helped. Um, I think other people have tried it and didn't think, you know, but who knows, so. You can, there, eventually, you, oh, she wanted to know if we could do the prescription. Um, to get this CBD with THC in it, with that low concentration of THC, then you have to have a prescription. But to get just CBD, which they sell over the counter, you know, in little formularies, you don't need a prescription. So, you, yeah, I guess. It's, it's not known where that little bit of THC makes a difference. When they did the epilepsy studies, they thought that the THC made a little difference. And that's why the state got involved with regulating it, so. Okay, we use Botox for everything. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah, one more question. So when the legislature decided not to include painful neuropathy, was that based on the illegal use of Botox? Or what no, you know, I was part of that whole thing, or I was watching it from a distance, because neurology, the Texas Neurologic Society got involved. And um, I think part of it is political that they felt like it would open the box too wide. And they, you know, the people who, Dan Patrick had a lot of trouble with this. And so it actually got voted out of the Senate when he was on vacation on, on purpose. He set it up that way. You know, he said, I'll be gone. <laughs> you can vote. And so they had a hearing and voted within about an hour at 8 o'clock one Thursday morning when he was gone. And then, but, you know, but then the governor signed it. So that's the other thing. So anyway, yeah, I think it was more political than it was. Anything else? Okay, so we try Botox for everything. Botox is an injection. It's a toxin that uh, makes your muscles weak. I don't know why it works for pain, but it seems to. So they're doing some trials with that. I thought this one was interesting. So when they talk about plasticity of the central nervous system, they're talking about the way your brain remodels in response to a stimulus. So for example, um, if you have a limb amputated, some people get phantom limb pain. So the thought is that your nervous system, your sensory pathways have remodeled around that in a bad way, and so it leaves you with chronic pain. Um, and so they're looking at neuroimaging to look at how the central nervous system remodels itself around chronic pain related to peripheral neuropathy. I think that's kind of cool. Um, hopefully they'll come up with something and figure it out. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know where. I, I didn't, I figured we didn't have enough time to do all that, but. It'd be interesting. So I'm going to bring up exercise because it's really being looked at. A lot of the studies done in Texas right now are about this exercise thing. So small studies show that exercise significantly reduces pain and neuropathic symptoms. And it specifically, it increases the intradermal nerve fiber branching layer. 
And so this is the slide that you would see if, I don't know if any of you have had um, a skin biopsy to diagnose your peripheral neuropathy, but we do punch biopsies for skin. They're just little tiny, um, probably two millimeter little punch biopsies. They're really easy to do. And they, they look at it under a microscope and they stain for this intra, oops, I keep doing that, for this intraepidermal layer. So if you have a small fiber neuropathy, these little nerves drop out. They're not there anymore. So normal is you would have about six nerves per slide, six little skinny little nerves per slide. Abnormal is you don't have any. So it's kind of a very good objective measure for how neuropathy is doing. Because otherwise you're just talking on the pain scale and that's a more subjective kind of thing. So. Um, So what they found, so going back to this exercise, that's what we're talking about. What they found is that this metabolic syndrome tends to predispose people toward neuropathy um, more than we give it credit for. So we've always known that, um, that diabetes and prediabetes predisposes toward neuropathy. But even if you have this metabolic syndrome, it tends to predispose toward neuropathy as well. And so it's, a, it's four things, the abdominal obesity, hypertension, insulin resistance, and then high triglycerides. And then they think that long-term inactivity is pro-inflammatory. And so um, idiopathic peripheral neuropathy is more common in metabolic syndromes. So the benefits of exercise, somebody found by doing these little nerve biopsies, I mean skin biopsies, that um, it increase, exercise increases cutaneous re capacity. It also improves your BMI, your uh, weight, basically. It improves glucose tolerance and it decreases your blood triglycerides. And so there's a new trial called the ADAPT trial, Activity for Polyneuropathy. It studies type 2 diabetes. Um, it randomizes participants into annual generic counseling, just, and then an integrated program of moderate supervised exercise based on anti, I can't even read those words, anti-sedentariness counseling. So this is a big trial. It started at Utah, I think, with Gordon Smith. I'm not, I think he's the one that started it, but a lot of um, places around the country are getting involved in this. I think the, anyway, the funding's pretty good. So the bottom line is walk your dogs, and if you don't have dogs, walk them anyway. And, and just to be honest, so the, the exercise that they are counseling for is four days a week for an hour at a time to get your heart rate 50 to 80% of max. So it's not just walking your dogs, especially if your dog's old. I mean, it's like, it's like really exercises. Get out, you know, and do something for an hour where you sweat, you know, four times a week. I thought this was interesting. I've never heard of amylin. Amylin is an apparently a uh, peptide hormone that's in the gut. And um, it gets, increased uh, release when you have type 2 diabetes and it thought that aggregates of amylin was found in the peripheral vasculature. And so they're, they're thinking they're going to uh, try to use a drug that fights the amylin, that blocks the amylin. So who knows if that'll turn out to be something good or not. I'll just tell you guys, um, just from a, a perspective, my perspective of 30 years in neurology, you know, they'll publish initial studies. It takes a good... 10 to 15 years after something comes up, some idea comes up to find out that it really works. And so I, I don't read a lot of brand new trial results. You know, I, I, I tend to wait, you know, until it really gets translated into um, real life. And, and I tend to be a late adapter. I'm one of those people that waits, you know, until, until the first people have bought the new car and then I'll buy it later, you know. But, and same thing with drugs. But you don't want to get all wrapped up in the new stuff because there's a really good chance it won't work. And sometimes even when the first trials come out and they say it works, sometimes the second bigger trial won't show an, ep uh, an effect. So it's fun to hear about them, but, um, anyway, but you never know how they'll turn out. So This is one, the treatment of uh, pain and cryptogenic sensory painful neuropathy. These are the same patients that we did the trial on earlier where we had the four drugs. And they're using topiramate. But this one's interesting because it says a potential disease-modifying therapy. 
So it wouldn't be just for the pain. They're wondering if, if actually topiramate has some, something about it that would make um, the neuropathy not as bad. Um, they're trying, there's a bunch of acupuncture trials for cryptogenic painful peripheral neuropathy, and then somebody's trying essential oils. I mean, there's all kinds of trials. This is a, oh, go ahead. Oh, what it is? It means you get a painful peripheral neuropathy, and we don't know why. Yeah, we can't find a cause. So some of those people are going to fall into metabolic syndrome. And some of those people are really, really early diabetes. And then some people don't have any of those risk factors, and they still get a painful peripheral neuropathy, and we don't know why. So that's cryptogenic. So CMT, this is Charcot-Marie Tooth. These are the hereditary neuropathies. And this is type 1A. So these are, does this ring a bell for y'all? Have you heard of this? Anyway, anyway, it's a, it's a genetic neuropathy. And so in regular people, this is the PMP22 gene. And we all have two copies, one from our mom and one from our dad. For some reason, if you have CMT type 1A, you inherit a gene that gives you three copies. And that third copy is supposed to be, it's supposedly toxic for some reason. It's what causes the disease. If you have a hereditary neuropathy with a tendency to pressure palsies, which is a different type of inherited neuropathy, you only have one copy of your PMP gene. And so this is a trial of this drug called PXT3003 to improve disability. So this is a combination trial of baclofen, which is an anti-spasticity drug, naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist. So it's a medicine that blocks the effect of opiates. It's used for people who are addicted to opiates a lot of times. And then um, desorbital, which is just a sugar. So it's a combination drug, and they're just giving it to people with CMT type 1A to see if it might block some of those toxic effects from that extra P and P gene that they have. So who knows? They had trouble with the drug, apparently, so the, drug's on, the trial's on hold right now, but I think they'll probably fix that. And I don't know what the results are. These are on all ongoing trials. This one, though, is the big one. So this is interesting. So this is it from Ohio State. And it's a true gene therapy trial. And it's hard to read. I can't even say it. But when you're reading the literature, this NTF3 or NF3 is what you want to pay attention to. So it's the way that they're modifying the genome. Let's see. So it's open-labeled, one-time injection. They're studying cohort one will be three subjects. And cohort Two is six subjects. So they're studying very few people. It's really just getting started. But Ohio State are the people who just came up with the gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. They have made a real game changer for kids with this really horrible disease. I mean, they have cured it with gene therapy, which is unheard of, never happened before. This is a great thing. Anyway, and so I guess they're the same people are looking at um, Charcot-Marie too. So I, I think this is something to watch. So, let's see, I'm just going to read this. CMT1A, the gene that provides the instructions for making peripheral myelin protein is duplicated, leading to overproduction. And they're trying to, NT3 belongs to the nerve growth factor family, and they're trying to make that work. Anyway. Um, they did a preliminary trial with this and had good results. Again, it was eight patients that they treated, and they actually inject the drug into the muscle, that, and it was the lower leg muscles, basically. And um, the four people who got the NT3 had an improvement, and the four people who didn't did not. So it's, it's kind of hopeful. That's, that's worth watching. So. Go ahead. Would that be helpful with someone who has demyelination? Well, so CMT type 1A means that the Schwann cells don't form right, and so your myelin, your insulation around your nerves is not right. And so the nerves conduct very slowly, so a normal nerve conducts at about 50 meters per second. And somebody with CMT, it would conduct at 15 meters per second. And so it does have something to do with the myelin, but it's not, 
um, as opposed to CIDP, which is an acquired autoimmune inflammatory problem, um, this would be a genetic problem. CMT is genetic. So CMT trials, um, there's a couple of them out there, and there's some, some continuations of them. This is, this, I've been practicing saying this word, roxino, roxinolixizumab. So any of these, whoops, I keep doing it. Hold on. Any of these MAB drugs are monoclonal antibodies, and they use them a lot to treat um, rheumatoid arthritis. They, they modulate your immune system. And so it's not surprising that they're going to try some of these drugs for people with CIDP. So that would be worth watching because, you know, IVIG is a hassle, you know, and it would, it would be nice to have something else that works. Um, they're doing a continuation of the Hyzentra trial. Hyzentra is at 20%. Um, IVIG that you can inject subcutaneously. They just did a big trial and showed that it worked and it helped. Um, it's just a little bit easier, less hassle sometimes to do it subcutaneously yourself than to go get an injection. And then there's, of course, the stem cell transplant trial and process that came from the University of Chicago. It's fully enrolled, it's ongoing, and the results should be out in, I think, a couple of years. So. And this is, I'm getting to the end here, but uh, I thought this was an interesting slide. This came from the Hyzentra trial. They had 30% um, of the people who were diagnosed with CIDP that were referred for this trial turned out to not have CIDP. They had all kinds of other stuff. They had diabetic neuropathy, ALS, fibromyalgia, um, multifocal motor neuropathy. I mean, there was a lot of different things that they had. So that was kind of an interesting thing um, that they figured out from that trial that was helpful. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, well. And this is just the trials in Texas that I know are going on, and I only know people in uh, San Antonio and Houston. So anyway, but massage therapy and cancer neuropathy, neuromodulation for chemotherapy neuropathy, topiramate, that trial for the um, C-SPAN. And then, um, anyway, you can read them. So there are some going on in Texas now, too. And that's the end. So questions? Oh, this one? Yeah. You know, alcohol causes a pretty significant neuropathy. I think it's probably underdiagnosed because uh, uh, you have to drink fairly heavily, I think, more than your doctor to get diagnosed with an alcoholic neuropathy, but, <laughs> and, uh, but it, anyway, it, it's pretty common. It's more common than you think, so, yeah. Say what? Sure, yeah. One more question, then we'll quit. So the gene therapy, those that are recently successful, would, would those be successful no matter what the age is? I don't know. So they limited the age to, I think, 15 to 35. Yeah. But you would, you would kind of think so. I know. <laughs> I know. And to be honest, you never know when these things will come to market, if they will come to market, you know. Um, for the, for the treatment of SMA, that came to market quickly because it's a fatal disease for a neonate. It's a fatal disease for a baby. So they, they really hurried that up and got it sent through. And um, if it's the only treatment and it seems to work well, it, it should go faster. But I don't know if it would work. Um, I kind of think it would, but I don't know. It may not get your feet back. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think I better quit. Uh, maybe oh. we can take one more question, and okay. then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Of the Sorry. Day. Okay. I have a question regarding the stem cell transplant. Can you elaborate on that? I mean, a lot of folks get stem cell transplants. I'm considering one. I don't know if there's a lot of you. Is that some, but considering it was a huge one to look at, but is that, is that study looking at those that already have stem cells? 
No, it's it, it was a specific trial for CIDP. So you had to go to Chicago. They had to make sure that you had CIDP from a really strict set of criteria. And then they did the stem cell transplant. And, um, and now they're following the patients. And so basically with stem cell transplant, they wipe out your your immune system, and then they reconstitute it with your own immune system, hopefully in a better sh in better shape. So, oh, I think we better quit. All right. Thank you, Dr. Austin. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, just as a reminder, if you couldn't hear um, the announcement that was made, the slides will be available in the week or so after the um, after the conference is over. So, and all of the people who have registered online will be able to get a copy of those slides. If you need them, um, make sure you leave your email address um, with the foundation before you leave. If you did not register online. Um, additionally, there will be a question and answer session at the end of today's um, all of the end of the today's talks. So, if you could um, just write, keep your questions in mind, and we'll be do our best to answer those when we have time at the end of today's talks. Next up, we have um, Megan Fraser to present on maintaining your independence at home and on the road. Megan is an occupational therapist and driver rehab specialist with more than 15 years of experience working in various adult settings within the medical model, with the medical model including acute care, skilled nursing facilities, home health care, and outpatient rehabilitation. She earned a BA degree in art therapy and a master's of science degree in occupational therapy from Springfield College. Her clinical practice focuses on driving safety, return to driving, home modification, aging in place design, and mobility assessments for the aging population. Megan is the owner of Central Texas's first private practice focused in driving. Functional stability and mobility addresses driving safety, return to driving after a medical complication, including adaptive driving and driving retirement. She also provides home safety evaluations, and aging in place education to help people remain in their home. She has made presentations at regional and state conferences. She also serves as the vice president for the Texas Chapter Association of Driver Rehabilitation and on the Occupational Therapy Advisory Board for University Mary Harlan's Hardin Baylor Occupational Therapy Program. Please join me in welcoming Megan Frazier. everybody. Um, so I'm Megan. I'm an occupational therapist and driving rehab specialist. And my guess is that probably nobody here knows what a driving rehab specialist is. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you guys right away, I am not here to take away your license. <laughs> um, everybody hears that and they think that my job is to come and evaluate someone and tell them it's time to stop driving. It's actually the exact opposite. Um, I specialize in looking at people's individual needs as their disease progresses and helping them decide what's next to keep them driving longer and safer in their community. Um, so that's what occupational therapy therapists that specialize in driver rehab does is we come in, we work with you, we decide what are your strengths and your weaknesses and we put them together and we keep you driving. <laughs> okay. okay. Driving is kind of the elephant in the room for a lot of people. It, what, and the reason is, is because driving is independence for people, especially here in Texas where we are extremely limited on our community resources, on accessing the world around us. So what does my driving mean? It's our freedom. It's how we connect with our family, with our friends, how we get to the doctors, how we get our prescriptions and go to the pharmacy. And when we can no longer drive, we become very isolated. And with the isolation comes depression. 
Um, it also, a lot of people really connect with driving because we start driving when we're about 12, 14, 16 years old. Especially in the elderly population, if you live on a farm here in Texas, you probably started driving the tractor at 12. <laughs> Um, so when somebody comes in and all of a sudden you can't drive or someone's telling you can't drive anymore, you start to panic. Oh my gosh, how am I going to get around? Who am I now? Probably everybody in this room remembers their first car. <laughs> they probably don't remember when they started walking. They may not remember people that may be their favorite subject in school, but they remember their first car, especially men. Um, that's something that people connect with because it's associated with a sense of freedom. Um, so driving is extremely, extremely important in people, so, to people. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that elephant in the room when you can no longer drive, nobody wants to talk about it. Driving in the body. Um, so when we start to drive, we don't think about what it takes to be a driver. We get in the car, we're usually a kid, we're usually 16 years old. Our parents tell us, okay, we're going to go drive on this dirt road or this back road in a parking lot. We get in, we start the car, we start driving. Our job as occupational therapists is to look at the components of driving. What does it take for you to actually be able to drive? And people really don't start thinking about that until you can no longer do it or you start to have problems. So er areas that affect your driving or are needed for driving are strength. You need leg strength, arm strength. Core strength. If you're having core problems, you may, when you turn the wheel, you might actually fall over. People don't really think that you need to have back and belly muscle strength in order to drive. Endurance. You know, when we're young, we can drive for long periods of time. I had someone earlier tell me, I drove 1,600 miles last week. That takes a lot of endurance. And with neuropathy, that endurance starts to go down. And it could be limited by pain or just fatigue. Your muscles get tired. Reaction time. Reaction time is huge. It slows down as we get older, and then when you add a progressive disease process, that reaction time can also be impacted. We've all heard the stories where somebody wanted to stop and they couldn't. They hit the pedal, um, the gas instead of the brake, or they just didn't stop in time, and unfortunately they hit somebody or a tree or ran into the local store. Um, so that's your reaction time. Range of motion. People don't really think that if you can't hold your ankle up, and you can't get it up and down, that's what you use to step on the gas and the brake. So when your range of motion, especially in your legs, starts to get limited, it affects your driving, your arms. If you can't turn the wheel, that's gonna affect how you're able to drive. Neck range of motion, arthritis, and neuropathy starts to affect your neck. So if you can't turn and look behind you or check your mirrors, that can definitely affect your driving as well. Neuropathy. We're talking about neuropathy today. So how does neuropathy actually affect driving? Pedal confusion is a big one. Um, I live up near Colleen. I walked into a mattress store about a month ago. And there was a big hole in the wall. And I asked the guy, what happened? He said, oh, this lady got a brand new SUV. She didn't realize which one was the brake and which one was the pedal. And she stepped on the, the, um, the accelerator, and she ended up in the middle of our store. <laughs> So it might be that you get a new car, it may be an old car, and you just don't know where your foot is, and you end up stepping on the accelerator versus the brake. The other part of that is pressure. When you can't feel your feet, you don't know how much pressure you're putting onto the ground. So you may think that you're pushing really hard on the brake, but you may not be. So you, start, you push down, you think you're gonna stop quickly, but you don't. Same thing for accelerator. You go to step on the accelerator, and you think, oh, I'm just going to creep forward a little bit, and you gun it, <laughs> and you shoot through that intersection. Um, it's scary not just for you. It's scary for your passengers, the people around you. So something else to think about. Fatigue. Fatigue is huge. Um, I know that that's something that is an experience for everybody here. Um, when you get tired, you, that affects your cognition. It affects your ability to actually physically drive as well, your vision, and your awareness of what's going on around you. Increased pain. If you're having pain, you can't pay attention well. You don't, you kind of lose track of what's going around you because of what's going on inside of you. You may get onset weakness while you're driving. So having a plan, okay, I'm tired now. My legs are not, are, have stopped working as well as they used to. What am I going to do now? So, and it also could do your arms, even your neck, your core strength. Um, difficulty getting in and out of the vehicle. A lot of people now are switching over to small SUVs. So that's something to consider. 
it's expensive to switch cars. So if it's hard getting in and out of more uh, a sedan, how what other adaptions can you put in your car to make it easier for you to get in and out? Maybe it's hard for you to lift your legs because they're getting heavy in and out of the car. What can I use to do that? There's leg lifters. There's um, a handy cane that you can put into the car to help you get in and out. So just having someone to reference and call when you start to have these problems is important. Slow reaction time, we've already discussed that. These are normal challenges for typical drivers that can be exacerbated if you have a progressive disease. Making left turns at an intersection without a traffic light. There's a lot that goes into driving, especially turns. You have someone coming at you. You have to judge their distance and their speed. You have to be able to turn your head, look what's coming to the side, what's coming in front, being able to quickly turn the wheel, how quickly you press on the accelerator. There's a lot of components that go into making a left-hand turn that when you're naturally doing that and you're younger, you don't actually think about it, but as we get older and the disease progresses, that's something that's gonna be a little bit more difficult because there are so many components involved. Um, driver distraction, cell phones is probably the number one thing, texting. Uh, driving at dusk or dawn. There's a, a part of driving that's called contrast sensitivity. And that's, what we've all noted, noted here in Texas, the deer. If a deer runs out at dusk, the ability to be able to see that deer in that twilight, that's contrast sensitivity. Or if it's a very bright day, you sometimes look and you don't see that white car on the side, same thing. Being able to see light colors next to each other. Merging into traffic, again, there's a lot of components that go into merging. You have to be able to scan, you have to see what's coming up behind you, you have to have depth perception, you have to be able to sequence that change and failing to yield right of way. One of the biggest things that people don't realize, and this is something that is very well researched, is falls in driving. And I'm sure that is something that is very fearful for people, is falling. And that's one of the reasons why falling and driving is very well linked. Because when fear sets in, you become more hesitant. You slow down. You don't take chances as you normally would. So they've actually done a lot of research around how someone who has a lot of falls, how do they drive? And there is a 40% chance risk, higher risk of being in an accident if you've had multiple falls. Right, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and people don't realize that. And it, it could be the fear, it could be the reason you're falling. Some people fall and they, don't, they haven't looked into, why am I now falling? It could be that you know, aren't able to feel your feet. Your balance may be deteriorating. It may be vision related. So if you are falling, going to your physician and ask and looking into those reasons that may be causing the falls um, is the first step in preventing an accident. Driving and medication. Um, Tiger Woods is a great example of this. Everybody thought he was drinking and driving. It wasn't, it was prescription medication. So. There is this fantastic website. If you guys have a pen, please write it down. It's called roadwiserx.com. The way this um, website works is you go to it, you have your list of medications. You type in your specific medication. It could be the generic form um, or not. You type it in and it will give you specific um, risks that that medication has with driving. So I pulled out Neurotin because that's something that is pretty typical with people in, with neuropathy. The reason it may cause increased accidents is trouble staying alert, difficulty concentrating, maintaining control of the vehicle, and changes in demeanor. What we, they meant in demeanor is you may become more frustrated and more angry at the world around you, so therefore you may react more quickly or more aggressively than you normally would. And I thought this was a pretty amazing statistic. Drug drivers are involved, um, prescription drugs are more prevalent of all drugs found in drug drivers involved in fatal crashes, 46%. That's huge. People think that alcohol or illicit drugs are what cause accidents. It's, it's not, it's the prescription drugs. So please, please write this down and type your, your, your drugs in and see if it will affect your driving. It doesn't mean that you can't drive, 
but maybe pay attention to when you're taking those medications and what you're doing while you're driving and how they may impact it. So that way you can take a step back and say, wow, I've really noticed some of these symptoms while I'm driving. Maybe I need to talk to my physician about it. Yes, ma'am. The ones that are listed, um, I typed in Neurotin, and that was what came up. Okay, state requirements. Don't worry, I'm qualified to drive. <laughs> so the thing with driving and driving rehab specialists, and I know this is being broadcast nationally, is every state has different driving requirements. Here in Texas, our driving requirements are, um, there's a medical advisory board who sets forth for every diagnosis what the driving restrictions are. In Texas, there really isn't anything for neuropathy. <laughs> So there's not a point where it says your neuropathy is getting to this part, we need to take away your license. There is nothing in our particular book here in Texas that states that. However, if the impairment is causing sensory or weakness, sensory loss or weakness, um, they do recommend a periodic review. However, they don't specify what that periodic review is. <laughs> What's that? I wrote those. Oh. <laughs> Um, warning signs, if you drive through wet concrete, that's probably a sign that we have an issue. <laughs> and this came from one of these books. This is from the Hartford Guide. Um, I, there are some out here. You can order them online at the Hartford Insurance Group. They're completely free. And it gives a nice list of warning signs. And this isn't specific to neuropathy clients. It's pretty much for everyone. So inappropriate driving speeds, too fast or too slow, accidents or near misses, difficulty with parking, others drivers honking their horns, passing you aggressively, um, if you're getting a lot of tickets, um, and of course here, accidentally stepping on the wrong pedal. The important thing to remember about these warning signs is, I'm sure all of us are looking at it and going, well, I, am, I, I identify with number two, and I've probably done number five. It's if you see more than one or two or three of these, or the frequency that you're seeing these signals are coming about, or your family saying, man, I've really noticed that you're doing several of these, that's when an evaluation should come about, or you guys should start having that discussion. If when I can no longer drive, what is that going to look like? A couple more. We just talked about looking at the frequency, changes in driving skills. A lot of people modify their driving behaviors without even knowing it. What that means is you may leave later in the morning rather than leaving at rush hour. You may not drive after 7 o'clock, or you may not drive before or after 6 o'clock because of the rush hour. You may only take local roads. You stop taking I-35. You avoid construction. So we, when we know that something's going on and we're struggling, we automatically adapt to what's going around. So taking a moment and thinking, have I started to already modify my behaviors? You get a little bit more frustrated. You get more anxious when you're driving. That's what that alarming reaction means. When you get into the car, are you really anxious? Are your hands gripped really tightly? You look down at your hands and you have white knuckles. Are, some, are you being more cautious when you go out? That's what those alarming reactions are. Track your changes. Unfortunately, neuropathy is a progressive disease. So start tracking your changes now. Being aware of your driving skills so that way as they change over time, you can identify with it. Ask your family. Your family also is aware that you're having changes in your driving behavior eventually. And they're equally as concerned, they just might not know how to bring it up to you. <laughs> I get a lot of calls from families that say, I'm really concerned about mom, and I don't know how to have that conversation. So maybe being the one to actually bring it up and say, I know I have a progressive disease. At some point, I'm no longer going to be able to drive. Can you help me figure out how I'm going to get places? Because having that plan in place makes that conversation a whole lot easier. Self-assessment tools. Everybody likes to know, <laughs> how am I going to assess myself? <laughs> um, safe driver. Uh, driver 65. There's a well driver toolkit. 
AARP and AAA have multiple self-assessment tools, and they're all free. What can you do to improve your driving? Adjust your driving time, meaning give yourself more time. Don't rush. Giving time to get to appointments. Choosing routes intentionally. I presented this conference um, in Austin um, at the support group here for the Neuropathy Foundation, and then one of my patients said, I leave 30 minutes earlier than I used to. I actually take a different route. She said, I always took this route to my doctors, but I found that if I take this secondary route, it takes me three more miles to get there. It takes me five more minutes, but I am so much calmer. There is so much less traffic, and I am so much less stressed out. And you know what? I feel better because of it. So she leaves earlier, takes a little bit longer route, but she said it affected her neuropathy um, in that her symptoms decreased because she intentionally planned out her route a different way. And then also, it's always good to have an idea, a plan if you need help. If you get someplace and you go shopping and you're tired afterwards and your symptoms flare up, what are you going to do if you can't drive home? Who can you call? We all have Uber and Lyft now. Thankfully, you guys live close to Austin, so that's available. But I live up near Fort Hood. That is not something that's available to the clients that I serve up in that area because it is a bit more rural. So having a plan that you can access easily. Uh, CarFit. Does anybody here know what CarFit is? CarFit is an amazing, amazing, amazing program. AARP, AAA, and the American Occupational Therapy um, Association got together and they put together a CarFit program. What that is, it's a free, it takes 15 minutes, and it's na nationwide. You drive up to a designated area at a designated time, and they do a 12-point inspection on how you fit in your car. So they look at the steering wheel, they look at your mirrors, they look at your seat position, they do a walk around the car with you to look at, are your tires pumped up correctly? Do you have any dings, dents? Are your, um, your lights fogged up? And it's completely free. They also give you a lot of resources that are specific to your community for transportation needs. They usually give you a free um, tire check um, thing, air pressure <laughs> check. Um, so it's a really great resource. Um, Scott and White in Temple is hosting one in October. I know there will be one here in Sun City later this month. There is usually one in Austin. Uh, Waco holds them pretty regularly at McLennan Community College. So they are around. If you go to the CarFit website, you can find a local. Are they available for people that are not in the AARP age Yes. They're completely free for whoever wants to sign up. Usually there's a sign up feature on the website or a phone number you can call. Uh, AARP driver safety course, and you guys are probably mostly familiar with that. You've taken it? That one should work. All right, is that better? Yeah. Good, okay. Um, I always encourage people to make an appointment with your physician because there may be something else going on that you're unaware of that's impacting your driving. Medications like we talked about before. Also, there might be something going on with your eyesight um, or there might be some, a medication that can help address any of the symptoms that you have. So I always say start with your physician first. Um, after you do the AARP course, but or you come to see me. I need a physician's order as an occupational therapist anyway, so I'm going to refer you back to your physician regardless. Uh, after you see the physician, 
You can make an appointment to come see an occupational therapist or driver rehab specialist. We are available nationwide. We are located in every state. You can locate us at ADAD, which is the Association for Driver Rehab Specialists, ADED.net, and that way you can look it up. You can find a driver rehab specialist in your area that can come out and do an assessment. Also, the AOTA, the Association for Occupational Therapy, they also have a list of driver rehab specialists um, that you can find in your area. There are two different types of OTDRSs. I own my own private practice, so I am home health based. I come out to you, we drive in your community, we see how you do driving in where you would normally go. There are also hospital based ones that you actually go to the hospital, you do the assessment at the hospital, you drive in a designated course, and they evaluate you that way. And then depending on your particular needs, we can look at adaptive driving. So if you're having a problem with your feet, we can look at hand controls, steering wheel adjustments, things like that. So it says, thanks to my occupation, my new compensatory strategies I learned from my OTDRS, I'm back on the road, which is great because walking everywhere had me barking mad. <laughs> okay, we already kind of talked about what an OTDRS is, so this is just a little bit more about what we do. Okay, what does an evaluation look like? What happens is we come to you or you go to the hospital. The first part is a clinical evaluation. It typically takes about an hour. We look at your strengths, your weaknesses, both physically and mentally, because you have to have the cognitive ability to drive as well. So what we take all of that information and then we do an on-the-road assessment. Typically our cars are like driver's ed cars. We take you out on the road and we assess how you do driving and what your driving skills are. It's not typically a pass or a fail. We look at it as a red, a yellow, and a green. Red is you do great. I'm sorry, green is you do great. <laughs> red is, yeah, we need to look at driving retirement. And yellow is somewhere in between. What can we do to keep you driving longer and safer? You're not ready to retire from driving yet, but let's make you a bit safer, and maybe we need to modify where and how you're driving. So, what equipment is available? Hand controls. Does anybody here drive with hand controls yet? Perfect. What kind of hand controls do you have? Push pull. Push pull, okay. This is a push rock. So I don't know if you guys can see it, um, but on the left here on the slide, you would pull it towards you to accelerate. Typically, push is brake. There are different modifications. It could be on the left side or the right side mounted. Uh, and it's all dependent on what the person needs. Left foot accelerator. So if it's just your right side that's affected, we can drive with your left foot. And then steering wheel modifications. There's different types of modifications. These are just two of them. The bottom one is a steering knob, so a spinner knob. Sometimes people call it a suicide knob in the olden days. <laughs> And then um, this one is just a palm. Typically, the way it works here in the state of Texas, again, every state is different. We go, we practice on these modifications. We make sure that you're able to drive in all the environments that you need to drive in. Then you go to the DPS and you take the driving test. You actually have to go through the normal driving test with the hand controls in the vehicle. Once you pass the driving test, you get a modifier placed on your license, and then the driving rehab specialist works with you and a mobility dealer to get that put into your car and make sure that it's specifically um, fit to the needs that you have. It depends. Um, they vary in price because there's different kinds. Uh, mechanical ones are tend to be a little bit cheaper, and then there's the electronic kind as well. There's positives and negatives to both of them. Um, they do sell them on Amazon and eBay. Please do not buy them. <laughs> um, th because you don't know who's putting them in, you're not safe to put them in, you wanna make sure that somebody is um, trained. The other thing is car insurances will not cover it if they're bought off of Amazon. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the mobility dealers. There's um, two located here in Austin. There's a couple in San Antonio, a couple in Waco. I know College Station has a few, and typically, um, you need to work with a driving rehab specialist even to get these put in because it's a prescription is written. Um, and so we would typically write the prescription, send it off to your referring physician, they would sign it off, 
and then we would give it to the mobility dealer. There are, unfortunately, insurance, everybody asks about insurance. Insurance does not cover modifications to the vehicle. However, there are grants and funding sources out there. You just have to work a little bit to access them um, and write to them to get those funding sources. Aging in place, I'm gonna quickly go over this. Aging in place is the ability to stay home and in your community longer and safer. It is a huge hot topic right now for people and we want people to stay in the community longer because it's just, it's better for you. You stay healthier longer. Living room, these are just pretty basic. An OT can come into your home, assess your environment and really look at what you need in your environment and tailor it to you. Some basic things for the living room. Remove throw rugs and cords, anything you can trip over. Increase your lighting. So daylight light bulbs are fantastic. It takes away some of those shadows. Increasing, um, it should be seat heights. So it's easier to get up and down off of a higher seat. And using voice activated controls. People don't think about this, but Amazon Echo and the Google Home sync to, likes, to light switches and lights now. So it reduces your need to be able to get up and down to turn off lights and turn on your TV. It's amazing. So people um, are a little bit hesitant to incorporate some of these electronic devices, but it really does um, help with fatigue. Um, and when you are having pain, it helps reduce that need to get up and down to, to turn on lights and turn them off. Kitchen, rearrange your cabinets. Pull everything down so it's a little bit closer to you so you're not having to reach up high or reach down low. Handles versus knobs, what's easier for you to open? Typically levers on doors are easier um, and more ergonomically um, appropriate for people, but sometimes knobs, if you have arthritis on top of it, maybe knobs are easier for you. Kitchen sink with a spray handle, being able to pull that water towards you. And always having a seat close in the kitchen. A lot of people's kitchens nowadays are nice and open and they have no place to sit, so bringing in a stool uh, or a rollator or some sort of walker to sit on so that you can rest when you need to is huge. Bathrooms. Unfortunately, bathrooms are expensive to remodel. So being able to modify the bathroom and put in equipment that you need is important. Shower bench or a tub transfer bench where two legs are on the outside. Handheld shower heads or a long handled sponge. Grab bars. Grab bars are huge, put them in. Nowadays, people are more aware of aging in place. It used to be people would see grab bars and they didn't wanna buy their people's homes. Nowadays, they're pretty. You can get good looking grab bars, even at Home Depot and Lowe's, they're nice. Non-skid flooring, so little strips. You can find that at Home Depot and Lowe's and cut it to length. Lowering the setting, setter, setting on your water heater. Please, 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 if you do anything today, go home and lower your setting because if you can't feel the temperature of the water, it's easy to get scalded. The other thing, real quick, I'm sorry, I wanna bring this up because I didn't put it on the slide, driving retirement. Driving retirement is the idea of planning for when you are no longer going to be able to drive. People are very familiar with the idea of retirement from employment. It's something you plan for, it's something you set aside money for. Um, everybody in here is over probably the age of about 35. Most of us are going to outlive our driving years. So that is the other thing I'm gonna empower you guys to do is go home and think about when it is your time to no longer be able to drive, how are you going to handle that? What are you going to do? Okay, because there are resources. Again, I put this out there in the back there's actually worksheets on when you're no longer able to drive. Who are you going to call? What might it cost you? Looking at, okay, I drive now. This is what my car costs me per month. This is what I can put towards driving retirement because I'm no longer spending it on my car. We are going to outlive our driving age, even me. So we are hoping that autonomous vehicles someday will be available, but they aren't yet. So <laughs> what are we gonna do in the meantime? So please, 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 Think about um, what are you going to do when you no longer are able to drive and have that conversation with any family members that you have because it is imperative um, that you start that conversation now because it'll make it a whole lot easier going forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. 
Okay, well, um, we are scheduled for a little bit of a break, so feel free to stretch your legs. Um, the food is still there from breakfast as well as beverages. They'll be breaking that down pretty soon, so um, if you want anything, feel free to help yourselves now. And um, we'll probably resume in about 15 minutes. Um, so for everyone that's also watching through live stream right now, um, we're gonna be taking a little bit of a break and we should be starting in about 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Before we get started um, with the integrative approaches to chronic illness, I want to introduce the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's board president, Lou Mazaway. Lou resides in Arlington, Virginia, and has practiced law his entire career with Groom Law Group chartered in Washington, D.C. Groom is the largest employee benefit law specialty firm in the country, and Lou has more than 40 years of experience with the firm working on a wide variety of matters such as tax, tax aspects of employee benefits, including pension, 401k, health and insurance plans for Fortune 200, tax-exempt, institutional, and state and local government clients. In 2003, Lou was first affected with peripheral neuropathy, a, rare, um, a relatively rare autoimmune variety associated with anti-MAG or monoclonal gamma therapy, uh, gamma therapy, of undermined surface significance. Sorry, excuse me, that's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> um, his, he, was, he was fortunate to become a patient of former FPN board member, Dr. David Kornblath, who has helped Lou manage his illness for many years. Alongside FPN, Lou is funding the Imagine study, focus on, focusing on PN patients and anti-MAG with a global developing more information on effective treatment strategies. Welcome, Lou. Well, yeah, thanks so much, Lauren, and all the folks who, at, on my staff, uh, Lindsay and Nancy, and uh, obviously Nancy and, and Lauren helped put this together, and the sponsors. and. It's just, I've been the president of the foundation for about three years now. It's a great, it's a privilege of, for me to do that. And, uh, you know, when I speak, I, I really like to give a personal, uh, you know, my experience. I've had this, you know, neuropathy for almost 17 years now. And it is, you know, it, it's a life-changing thing. I think the, the, just the way this program is set up, is so perfect because once you think you have neuropathy, maybe you do, maybe you don't, the first thing to do is find a good neurologist like Dr. Austin, I have Dr. Kornblath, find, and if you need to travel to see an expert, it's a, an investment that's worth making. Once you have that, the foundation, he or she will help, you know, hopefully diagnosis challenging, once it's diagnosed, you know, you get the meds, hopefully are the right combination of meds that you need, and that's different for everybody. For me, Neurontin is, I don't have any side effects. But for a while there, after a while, it wasn't enough, and rather than increase the Neurontin, my doctor said, why don't we try a small dose of this tramadol? So I take sort of a combination of drugs, and that's been a good, for me, Everybody's different. That's been, you know, worked well. But then once you get past that, the important thing is to, living with neuropathy, is to find the right team of folks to help you. Folks like Megan, you know, a gym, a personal trainer. My personal trainer has been so important to me to find the right routine uh, that I can do, live with and understands my condition. And, uh, you know, that's a hard thing because, you know, we don't want, the thing you want to avoid is kind of what Megan said, you know, less mobility, you know, more just to stay at home and, and lose your independence. And so programs like this, I think, are perfectly geared to emphasize the right things. And uh, so, and again, and not to mention, and support groups. I've been in very involved with the DC group, which is a very active group. The support group here in Texas is probably a model uh, for the whole country of being a very, an excellent group.
group that's well run, its outreach is outstanding. And so, and you know, the support groups, you learn from each other, you get good speakers, hopefully, you know, like not only doctors, but we get those, but therapists that can help uh, emphasize what, you know, folks may not realize that they need. So anyway, that's, that's my, just a personal note and the way I kind of view this and, and I wish you all to live the best lives you can and I think, hope this program is helpful to you to do that. So thank you. Next up, we have um, Jesse Wells speaking on the integrative approaches to thriving with chronic illness, addressing the mental, emotional, and relational aspects of your journey. Jesse Wells is a psychotherapist, integrative nutrition coach, and educator. Her mission is to support those around her to live with abundant wellness. She believes that she believes that it is in the context of relationship that we change, wholeness, and life happen. Jesse's passion is the intersection of science, relationship, wellness, and spirituality. Her clinical work emphasizes interpersonal neurobiology, attachment, mindfulness, body-based trauma techniques, and holistic nutrition. She has professional experience in hospital, nonprofit, and outpatient mental health organizations. Currently, Jesse runs a wellness practice in Austin, Texas, and also provides services at Austin Stone Counseling Center. She is a TBRI practitioner and is trained in EMDR, or eye movement desensitization, desensitization and reprocessing. Jesse's specialty include anxiety, chronic illness, chronic pain, relationship issues, spirituality, and identity development. In addition to individual services, Jesse offers group services and workshops to clients, corporate organizations, nonprofits, and health professionals. Please join me in welcoming Jesse Wells. Hi, how are you all doing today? Uh, awesome. So, like she said, my name is Jessie Wells. Uh, I'm a therapist here in town. I work with a lot of individuals with a variety of... Um, do I need to talk louder? Oh, hello. I hear that a lot when I speak, actually. So, I work with... Um, so, y'all let me know if I need to talk quieter or louder. Um, I work with a lot of individuals with um, chronic illness and their family members. And so, I, I want you all to know that um, it's a great honor for me to be here today because the amount of courage it takes to even face um, an illness and address, uh, like, being honest with ourselves about our limitations and come to an event like this, um, it, it takes a lot of courage and there's a lot of strength that you all bring to the table just being here. And so that's an honor for me. And hopefully there'll be a few things in here that can help. Let's see if I know how to work this. So here's... That's a really big picture of me. I'm going to just scroll through so that I'm not so large on the screen. So to tell you a little bit about why I uh, have a passion for chronic illness, it, I'll share a bit of my own story. I am a celiac disease um, patient. Um, I'm, it's treated, but I had 20 to 25 years of chronic pain and illness and have had to make a number of lifestyle changes. And so because of that, as a therapist... I saw many of my clients coming in with depression, anxiety, grief, relationship issues, but this undercurrent of illness and knowing how to make some lifestyle adjustments, like lifestyle involving exercise, food, uh, meditation, um, I saw that improve their relationships and improve their spiritual life and improve their emotional life, but also, also really gave them a lot of coping skills for their illness. And so, um, anyway, that, in addition to that being helpful for me, it, it's been really uh, a big component of my work with clients. So if you, so I want to start with an exercise before we jump in. And here's the reason. Um, if we are in an environment like this, there's a lot going on. 
everybody had stuff going on this morning. Um, it's really hard to focus and internalize what we're experiencing. So bear with me. This might be a little different than some of the other presentations, but just want to invite you guys to become a little bit more aware of what's going on inside of you. Um, so this is an exercise put together by Dan Siegel. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He is an expert on mindfulness and interpersonal neurobiology. And what we know is that, um, and I'll talk about the science behind this in a bit, um, that much of addressing mindfulness begins with just being aware. So I want to invite you all to close your eyes. Um, if you don't want to close your eyes, if that feels weird, choose an object to look at in the room that is neutral or pleasurable, so not something that's disturbing to you. Um, and I just want to invite you guys not to look at each other so that everybody feels safe to just kind of try this. So close your eyes, take a few deep breaths, and just notice where your breath is going. Is it high up in your chest? And if it is, I want you to allow yourself to notice your ribs expanding with each breath horizontally out towards your elbows. You might even notice the tiny muscles in your back being stretched. And I just want to invite you to slowly expand your lungs. And slowly allow the air to come out of your body. Just focus your on your breathing. If you find another thought come into your head, just go back to your breath. Some people really respond well imagining a, a color or an emotion to breathe in, filling their lungs. And then with your imagination, watching the exhale flow out of your nose like a color and a puff of air. So while you're here, I'm going to take you through a diff few different aspects of who you are. I want you to notice if there's what sensations you have in your body. Perhaps there's pain. Perhaps there's numbness. Perhaps there's tightness in your back or your chest. Maybe you're hungry. Just notice what those sensations are. And just observe, almost like you're an outsider. You might notice what it feels like to be in the chair, your weight against the back of the chair. And then I want to invite you to step into a different part of your awareness and notice if there's any images that are going through your head. You might notice if, if you happen to be looking around what, what you see in the room. Just take note of the images that are popping up in your head or in the room. Allow yourself to be curious. And then I want to invite you to take another step, almost a bit more inward, 
to see if there's any feelings you're aware of. Maybe you had a fight with a family member. Maybe you're bored. Just acknowledge the feelings. Allow yourself to view them as an outsider. You might even notice that some of these are uncomfortable for you. And if they are, that's okay. Just notice what you notice. Notice what is passing through your awareness. You might notice that you're content or happy. Some people even find that they notice their emotions in different parts of their body. And then I want you to take one more step into a different part of your awareness. And I want you to notice what you're thinking about. If there are thoughts that have jumped into your awareness in this exercise, maybe about all you have to do today, maybe about what happened earlier in the week, I just want you to notice your thoughts. So now I want you all, I want to invite you all to be aware that we can set aside this information when we're not focusing on it. Your attention just moved from one to another thing to another. And one of the ways we can set aside information is by having an image of a place or a container where it can be kept until it's ready to be reviewed. So in your mind, I'd like you to imagine a container that's strong, safe, and secure. Once again, just bear with me on this. So this can be a box, a purse, a container, um, whatever whatever you want it to look like. Make it pretty, colorful, ornate, or plain and simple. It's up to you. Let it have a top or a lid that can be closed and opened, whatever you want. Some people like having a lock on theirs. Other people don't need a lock. So go ahead and imagine that container now and just notice what comes to mind. So I want you to do whatever you need to do to imagine that box. Some people have it in their hands. um, Some people have it in front of it. But I want you to let everything that is moving around in your mind float into the container. All the sensations that we talked about, maybe there's pain, numbness, tightness. Allow the sensations to float into the container. Notice if there's any images, maybe from your week before, or that you're thinking about in the future. Any feelings, fear, anxiety, grief, whatever's going on in you, I just want you to allow yourself to use your imagination to put that aside in this box. And any thoughts? Maybe there are thoughts from previous presenters. And I want you to just notice that you can put them in the container. And just here now, you can just be. Now, if everything's inside, go ahead and close the container and put it away for later use. If you're having trouble putting it in the container, some people feel like they need to shove it in a little bit. Other people 
might drop it in the ocean. Whatever it takes to put the container away. If you notice anything that needs to be put in the container, go ahead and put it in there. And shut the container and put it aside, knowing you can pull it out when you need it. And here, I just want you to go back to your breathing. Just notice your breath. And when you're ready, I just invite you to bring your awareness back to the room. I'll give you a few more minutes. I wonder if there's any brave souls out there who might be willing to share what that was like for them. Anybody? Yeah, it was relaxing, is what she said. Any others? Relaxing and freeing. Less anxious. Like you need it. I support you having another massage. Yes. Um, <laughs> that sounds awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, that's great. So she said she was looking, she has trouble closing her eyes, which is common, and she was looking at the mountain scene and wishing it was just the valley and not the picture. And I actually, I love that you brought that up. There's a reason that I have nature in most of my slides. Um, nature therapy is huge for our chronic pain clients, for depression, anxiety, um, a lot of times, first line of defense is I will just have somebody go sit in nature or look at pictures of nature. And uh, there's cognitive studies that have been done that have shown students who do their homework and their schoolwork in nature, they perform better on tests. And even if they have pictures of nature in their classrooms, they perform better than in a standard classroom. So um, I love that you said that about nature, and um, I, I encourage you all to incorporate that into your lives. So, so we'll talk a bit more about the science behind what we just did there and um, in a moment. But I, I want to start the discussion about that we're about to have with resilience. So often we think of resilience as being strong tough being able to handle anything, meaning that we don't have difficulty. But and the reality is that resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity. So that could be trauma, that could be tragedy, that could be chronic illness, that could be having a loved one with chronic illness. So I want to encourage you all that being resilient does not mean that we don't experience difficulty or distress. It's not the individuals in our society that look strong and successful on the exterior that are resilient. They may be, but it's not their external appearance. I want to invite you to consider that individuals like Helen Keller, who was born blind and deaf, she was resilient. And there are a number of things that she did to enhance her resilience. It would be very easy for an individual with blindness and deafness to um, assume that they're a victim of their circumstance 
and um, not move beyond that. And so resilience is not about having physical capability. Resilience is about um, in the face of difficulty and distress, choices. And so um, additionally, resilience, there are some factors that increase our resilience, and there's a lot of research behind this in, you know, whether it be our DNA or our childhood or whatever. However, it's not a trait that people have or don't have. It's not that people are internally strong or not strong or can cope well with physical illness or not. Um, resilience involves behaviors, thoughts, actions that can be learned and developed. It's more like a spectrum and the hope is that each of us are moving more and more towards resilience, learning to cope in the face of difficulty. And um, often, and part of the reason I shared with you all about courage is that resilience involves courage because it's not muscling through or ignoring problems. It's the ability to respond in a way that moves through pain and suffering and challenge in as positive as, of a way as possible. So there's a few key traits in resilience. Um, one of them is embracing limitations, right? We were just talking about driving. If part of enhancing resilience may be acknowledging that you have some limitations in driving, that enhances your safety, right? Um, Resilience also means adjusting. And I, I wrote the metaphor of a tightrope walker. We often view balance or resilience as being consistent. But when we think about true balance, it's actually a picture of a tightrope walker, right? And they're continually walking on a tightrope and adjusting to the situation. They're adjusting to the rope. And, and that's what I want to encourage you all in this, and I have a few um, tools we'll talk about, that coping with illness is about flexibility and adjustment, being open to the changes that need to happen in order to live the most abundant way that you can. With that, I understand there's a lot of grief involved, there's losses, there may be anxiety, and um, we may not be able to do it alone. And that's where that last trait of asking for help comes into play. That resilience throughout the research really shows that the individuals who are able to ask for help when needed and increase their social connections as needed, um, they can move through challenge more easily. Not without difficulty. I'm just saying they can move through it more easily. And so asking for help can be finding the right doctor. It can be finding support groups here. Um, and we'll talk, there's tons of research about social connections and really even the alleviation of pain um, not necessarily in neuropathy, but um, there's a research study of individuals who were, had MRIs done on their own, and they had some sort of pain stimulus. And then they had a stranger hold those individuals' hands looking for a pain stimulus. And there was no changes between those two. The third group was individuals who had a loved one hold their hand. And the pain centers in the brain were actually decreased in the presence of a loved one holding their hand. There is something about the mind-body connection. And there's, you know, could be the oxytocin, could be placebo. Whatever it is, we know that it works. That when we have loved ones who are safe for us, that have empathy and can walk alongside of us, the presence of another 
loved one helps us cope with pain. So for those of you who are caretakers here, I just want to encourage you that your, your role is big. But in addition, you probably need other individuals in your life to provide the same. And so, um, okay, we'll go on. So the nervous system, obviously a lot of what we're talking about in the nervous system, a lot of the work I do with clients is actually on the vagus nerve. Um, uh, some neuropathy affects the, the vagus nerve, some doesn't. Um, I think my medical people here would be able to explain that a bit more. With that said, the vagus nerve is called the wandering nerve. It's the longest of the cranial nerves in the body. It runs down your throat, crisscrosses through all of your organs uh, or your visceral organs, and it's really responsible for um, regulation. So if we are in a fight with our spouse and we're very calm and normal and then a switch is flipped and we say things we regret, our vagus nerve is at play. That switch being flipped has moved us into the sympathetic um, fight or flight response. So our spouse suddenly becomes a threat to us versus someone we actually love and care about. So Small little tip, don't have conflict with your spouse in fight or flight mode because uh, it doesn't build relationship. So what happens when we are in this fight or flight mode, there's a lot of different responses, but um, it, it's an acceleration of the autonomic nervous system. So our heart rate increases, we have increased blood pressure, blood leaves the frontal lobe, which is why we shouldn't fight with our spouse or plan for retirement when we're anxious. Um, because the blood has left the frontal lobe, this part of our brain is really the human part of our brain, that mammals have the frontal lobe, humans have far developed frontal lobes, alligators have midbrains. So when the blood leaves our frontal lobe, we are really acting more like alligators than humans. And Alligators don't plan for retirement well. They also don't build relationships well, right? So you are really in a state where you're ready to fight or run. Um, we also um, might experience anxiety or dread. So individuals with anxiety, this is a big aspect where we're looking to calm the nervous system. Um, we might have racing thoughts, obsessive thinking. Um, this might be where we're in fear mode about our chronic illness, and we get what's called tunnel vision. So emotionally, we're running from a lion. When you're running from a lion, you're not looking at the sub sunset. You're not noticing all the beautiful things in the world or other possibilities. You're just saying, this might kill me, or this might hurt me, the lion. So um, we really... Um, notice this with especially a lot of chronic pain patients that it's your body is in this state of hyperarousal more often because of the pain, right? Physical pain and emotional pain, um, from a nervous system, system standpoint, we respond the same way. And so, once again, that's why when we're in pain, we may treat our loved ones like they're a threat more like we actually really care about them. And so um, understanding, if you are a loved one of an individual in pain, understanding that component for them is a big deal. Knowing, okay, well, let's, let's wait until you're at a, a better spot and talk about how we're gonna handle in-laws or our children, right? Um, so the sympathetic is really like the emergency break of our nervous system. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the uh, parasympathetic, is really like the brake pedal, right? So that is what this exercise that we just went through, the SIFT exercise and the container exercise and breathing was really designed to pull you all into that parasympathetic mode, which we'd call the rest and digest. It's sort of the healing state. It's the state where we can um, absorb our nutrients a bit more. We can connect deeply with others. Um, and what we know is that when individuals are 
rarely in this parasympathetic state. So for example, with anxiety or if their body is in this activated state, we see a lot of loneliness associated with that. And it's not because they are they have an absence of close relationships. It's because their nervous system is not in a state where they can connect deeply with other people. And so this parasympathetic state on the far end says it's safe to love, and this writing's really small, it's safe to love, play, to play, I can be present. So I don't want to take too much more time about that, but a lot of these exercises we're doing today are essentially about moving you emotionally to more of a parasympathetic state. Um, and anyway, we can talk about that. What we see is oxytocin increases there. We have more curiosity and openness, compassion for ourself and others. Um, we're more mindful in the presence uh, it, and in the present. And we can view things as an objective observer versus caught in all the emotion. So... So ways to engage the nervous system or move towards this parasympathetic state, and I'm not covering all of these. These are just a few things. Um, and we're running low on time. But is that diaphragmatic belly breathing that we did? So the belly breathing has tons of research um, about this. So two minutes of diaphragmatic breathing really change, lowers your heart rate, changes things. Um, so we also know, and this is... We look back through spiritual traditions, humming and singing can do the same thing. And so um, some exercise in massage and laughter. So I encourage you guys, that goes back to the social connections, laugh more. If, if you need to watch like America's Funniest Home Videos, whatever it takes to laugh, I want you guys laughing, laughing right? Um, and then attention and mindfulness, becoming an objective observer. So that could be... When we're running from lions, we're not in a state of awe. We're not looking at the sunset. We're not looking at the mountains. And so taking time to become an observer of nature actually pulls us out of that sympathetic state and can come back that. Meditation, gratitude, um, and then connections. And I will end this discussion with this, the discussion on connections. In if you... Months ago, I was in the redwoods um, out in California. The redwoods are these huge, tall trees. And what we know about them is they don't actually have deep roots. But what the roots do is they actually connect with other redwoods. And that is a picture of resilience built through so social connection, is that as we connect with other people, other individuals who are struggling with the same illness, or other people who love us, who have other connections, that we build strength and resilience through those connections with others. So anyway, I'm out of time. So half of my discussion is, is not in here. But um, feel free to email me if you all have any questions. And um, it was a pleasure to be here today. So. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, we're going to get started with our panel discussion. So if I could invite all of our exercise panel members to um, take the stage, please. I'll give you a couple of seconds um, to get up there. Yes. So I'm going to start by um, introducing our our moderator for today's session. Um, Delisha, would you like to take over? Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I feel very weird up here. <laughs> but we're going to jump right in because I think we're, we're a little behind schedule. So uh, we're going to, uh, now that we're all relaxed, now we're going to talk about exercise, right? 
and I think you're going to get some really good information uh, from the ladies up here. Uh, we have Julie O'Connor, who is an adapted aquatic specialist. Raise your hand, Julie. And we also have Jenny Park, who's a physical therapist. And we also have Linda Gibson, who is a Tai Chi instructor um, and a martial arts specialist. I'll have to talk to you later. <laughs> um, and again, I'm Delisha McLean, and I'm actually on the board of the Neuropathy Alliance of Texas. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here to moderate today. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to have the whole panel answer our first question. The theme of today's conference is living your best life with peripheral, peripheral neuropathy. What is the main way participating in your exercise program could help our audience live their best lives? Let's start with Julie. Thank you. Well, I believe that water is a great equalizer. Oh, oh. sorry. I you might need I to a... turn them on. I think they're on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they're on. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had a big mouth there. But <laughs> what I was saying is that uh, water is a great equalizer, and it balances, it bathes the uh, central and peripheral nervous systems. Um, my work is based on hydrodynamic principles of buoyancy, resistance, drag, and turbulence. And all of these encourage balance and counterbalancing mechanisms in the body. These forces combined encourage strength, coordination, balance, cardiovascular health, and endurance. Immersion in water decreases pain and increases range of motion, and relief from everyone's worst enemy, gravity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. And Jenny, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, up here we have experts in Tai Chi and aquatics, and a lot of times with those, they're very helpful in looking at strength, looking at balance, looking at stamina. I think one of the things that physical therapists really focus on is function, you know, your everyday function. Can you go up and down stairs? Can you dress yourself? Can you drive? Can you do any of those things that you would normally do? And another focus that we look at also is if you have any restrictions. Do you have motion restrictions? Do you have restrictions in your joints that would keep you from doing that? Do you have muscular restrictions? Do you have significant weakness in specific areas that we can address that will help you get better at those functions, those everyday functions that are so important? Thank you, ma'am. And Linda? <laughs> First, I want everybody to understand what Tai Chi is. <laughs> tai Chi is Chinese martial arts. And what thousands of ancient Chinese know now is being validated in medical studies every single day. Studies on strength increase, studies on balance, studies on neuropathy, which the Neuropathy Alliance of Texas also undertook here in Austin. Um, I'm interested in that Tai Chi brings together some of the elements that some of the other speakers have talked about. For example, when we were learning from Megan about driving, range of motion and flexibility. One of my Tai Chi students says she comes to me because she can now turn her head back down her driveway and get out on a busy highway. So that's both flexibility and a little bit of range of motion. Um, also, just in terms of, I tell my Tai Chi students when we first start, I'm going to teach you to stand, I'm going to teach you to walk, and I'm going to teach you how to sit. Very basic. All of these things can be generalized into your everyday life. And that's where you start. Thank you, Linda. So um, just a reminder, if you could hold your questions to the end, I'm sure you will have some for these ladies. Um, so the second question, tell us how your program may benefit the audience with staying active as they navigate their journey with neuropathy. We'll start again with Julie. Well, and um, what I, aquatic exercise is fun. You know, it's playful activity. Up, 
It's a playful activity. <laughs> and with good instruction, those people can learn how to operate safely in the water and um, enjoy an exercise that they may not normally do. Um, I often will get people on one-on-one -on -one training because they're not quite comfortable in the water. So um, that way I can walk them through and have them learn equipment and feel confident in their um, abilities in a group situation. So I do do a lot of one-on-one -on -one because I work with a lot of medically involved people. Um, my certification is through the Aquatic Exercise Association, so I rec recommend them. And my training is through the Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute. And they have, um, if you go to atri.org, they have some very good articles for, you know, with, you know, there's some for many different diseases and disease processes, and very informative. And, you know, I just encourage you to try water. Thank you, ma'am. Jenny? One of the main things that physical therapists do that's different is we work on pain control. Um, as Dr. Austin was saying, exercise will increase blood flow to your nerves and those nerve cells. So when you have neuropathy, exercise is extremely important. But you have to know the limits. You have to know, have I overdone it? What can I do not to overdo it? and some of the things that you need to think about when you're exercising. Obviously, the first thing you want to do is check with your physician to make sure it's okay for you to do that, especially if you have secondary things like diabetes, heart disease, lung disease. Always a good idea to check with your physician before you do any of this stuff. Um, one of the things that you also want to look at is people with um, neuropathy have a higher a higher instance of entrapment issues, okay? So if you're doing something where you've got your elbows on a table, you can have entrapment problems with nerves. So what you want to do is when you get done with exercises, also you want to look, do a physical check, make sure that you're not having any redness on any specific areas that you're working on, that you're putting pressure through it, okay? It's very important to do that. Also, when you're doing exercises, there are some safety things that you want to think about, okay? One of them is that whenever you're doing an exercise, you should never, ever have sharp pain when you're doing any of these exercises, okay? That's a no-no. No pain, no gain is, quite frankly, horse hockey, okay? <laughs> pain is there for a reason. It's trying to tell you that your body's not ready for that or your body doesn't, it's not something that you need to be doing at that point. You can work up to being able to do that exercise again without pain, but just at that specific moment, your body's not ready for that. It's okay to feel discomfort when you're doing exercise. There's a difference between sharp pain and just discomfort when you're doing the exercise. But within 30 minutes of you doing that exercise, that should go away. If after 30 minutes you're still feeling that, again, it means your body's not ready for that, okay? And also, you know, guys, if you feel like an exercise is not helping you, stop. Don't keep going. <laughs> You're wasting your time, and a lot of times you can overdo it, and you can cause more, more problems with that. Um, ways that you know that you have overdone it, okay? One of the things is that when you get done with exercise, you should feel like you have done something productive, Okay, and that you may have a little bit more function after you do it. If you've ever done it, then you're going to feel weaker after you do it, and your function is going to change. Anytime you do an exercise, your function should not decrease after that. Okay, if your function overall decreases, then you, you've overdone it. If you do the exercise and after you can't stand up like you normally would, or you can't go up and down stairs like you normally would, then it's too much. You've overdone it. Excessive muscle soreness, okay? 24 hour, you know, you've done this. People go to the gym the first time they overdo it and they're sore for two days and they can barely move, okay? That's not what you want, okay? You wanna take your time, you wanna build up these exercises. Otherwise, you're just not doing in yourself any, 
any service, and also you can cause some damage to those nerves when you overdo it, okay? Um, severe cramping, you don't want that. Um, and shortness, prolonged shortness of breath is something that you also don't want. Uh, the other thing I will tell you too about exercise is I would not advise you to do any high impact activities or something where you've got a lot of resistance, okay? That's not good. It's not good for your body. And again, you're not helping yourself. You could actually be uh, doing detriment to what's going on with you. Thank you, Jenny. And Linda, how may Tai Chi and martial arts help our, our folks with neuropathy? Let's uh, go to the, my slide. As I'm pulling up the slides, we are going to have a question and answer session or um, section to this session. Oh, okay. Thank you. Can you pick up the mics when you um, Can answer you not the hear questions? Me? <laughs> I thought it was loud enough. Sorry. Here we go. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Okay. So I just wanted to show you what Tai Chi looks like. And this is a slide from the Tai Chi class for the Neuropathy Alliance. If you'll go to the second slide. What I teach are principles of movement. So, for example, looking at some of these, we're talking about body alignment, keeping the head and neck straight. We're going to move the whole body, moving the torso as one. The reason we do that from a martial arts defense perspective, you have to keep your eye on the enemy. So if you turn your head, guess what, and your enemy's over here, you're gonna lose sight of them. So those perspectives from Tai Chi can actually help you in alignment. The other thing that happens, and I think um, this helps from a neuropathy standpoint, and I don't know how it works. There have been studies, but we don't know the exact mechanism of how Tai Chi affects neuropathy. I've been teaching for about 13 years. I've been doing Tai Chi for about 23 years. I think I'm working on your nervous system. One of the principles of, of Tai Chi is shifting the weight from side to side you are never what's called double weighted. So for instance, you will have 60% of the weight in one side, 40% in the other, or 90-10. So you are always pressing down on your foot. You're changing your weight distribution from side to side, all the while keeping some of the, um, your center of gravity over top your hips. You always have your knees bent. You're using your muscles. You're getting stronger. Sometimes you may have more weight on one side than the other. We also do warm-ups in class. So my set of warm-ups goes through each and every joint, warms up the joint, gets things going before we even start. Of course, there's always the deep breathing. What do I tell my students? Breathe from the diaphragm, right? I've got a couple of students in here today, so I'm, I'm glad to have them here. And I think that summarizes quite a few of the aspects, but very much Tai Chi is a multifaceted approach. It involves relaxation, it involves weight shift, it involves uh, breathing as well as muscle and uh, coordination. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you both. Thank you all ladies. And our next question goes to Julie. What advice do you have to stay motivated to be active when your body hurts before you even get started exercising? Well, um, as Sir Isaac, uh, Sir Isaac <laughs> Newton stated that a body in motion stay, tends to stay in motion and a body at rest tends to stay at rest. So I encourage, you know, just taking those steps to get out the door um, I'm hearing a, a lot, you know, about, too, about relaxation and other strategies. Um, those are, I use those strategies in water 
when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one training. We have a whole language um, for therapeutic aquatics. We have Tai Chi in the water, um, which is an adapted Tai Chi specifically for water. And um, I have three rules to keep you in line, and that is if it hurts, don't do it, have fun, and no drowning. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, you know, you just go with that, and I say overcome and press on. You need to create time for yourself to take care of yourself. And taking those times of relaxation, being in nature, enjoying, you know, the surrounding, the, the pool is just such a nice, it's a big hug to me. <laughs> so you know, I love being in it every day. And uh, as Winston Churchill said, don't ever, ever, ever give up. So, uh, and, and another popular saying is just put things, put first things first. And um, that, that means your health. That is your priority because everything else, you know, surrounds your health and how you're taking care of your body. And I just think that water is a great way to do that. Thank you, Julie. Thank I think you. that's a great rule, no drowning. Uh, so the <laughs> next question is for our whole panel. How can your program be modified to accommodate different abilities? Do you have a variety of class levels? Are there devices that can help? We'll start with Julie. Uh, yes, at Sun City where I work, we have all levels of ex aquatic exercise classes. Um, I teach a beginner class called Aqua for Balance because I'm mostly in the, like I said, in uh, medically involved training people therapeutically one-on-one. -on -one. But I like to teach my class that is a great transition for uh, my people to see how they do in group. And then once we're in group, we, um, you know, they have the benefits of social interaction and, you know, just the fun quality. Um, I also teach, um, we, we also have beginner, advanced, and adapted swim instruction. Um, I'm very focused on posture, proper mechanics, spatial and kinesthetic awareness in the pool. A lot of people get in the pool and they just kind of bounce around. And we need to be putting our, you know, muscles to work and taking advantage of of that environment where you can. I mean, I have people lift weights. I put, you know, we do all kinds of things in my, and we have all kinds of equipment. Most people are familiar with a noodle and a barbell kind of thing for the water, but there is a whole lot more. And I also do massage in the water. So, um, but I have the equipment to hold a person up to do that. Um, so as I said, we use um, the noodles and the aqua barbells, and then I just, have the um, specific training equipment. Um, and that's about it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. How about you, Jenny? Um, I think the biggest modification that we can do in physical therapy, first of all, is looking at a specific, a patient-specific goals, what they want to get out of physical therapy, what are the things they want to work on. The second is, and most important is exercise modification. Like we talked about, if you're having pain with these exercises, there are ways we can modify that. We can decrease your resistance. We can decrease your range of motion. So like if you're doing a bicep curl, if coming all the way up is painful, what we can do is modify that so that you're not going through that full range of motion. You're going in that range of motion that's that is not painful. That way you're getting the benefit of it, but you're not getting the over overdoing. You're not overdoing it. You're not overworking that muscle. Um, the other one is like, the other one is resistance. Okay, whether you're working on the machines, whether you've got those lovely little bands that you take home, the different colors, then we work on resistance. If it's too much to do one color, too much to do one weight, then we fix that. And the other thing is frequency. How often are you doing the exercises, especially the ones that you take home? Um, you know, you may not do them daily. You may not do them twice a day. It depends on your function, your specific function, and what we're trying to get to. There's all kind of modifications. There's bracing that you can use. You know, one that comes to mind is the little one you can get at the store that's work on your, on your wrist. 
you know, if you're having trouble with your wrist doing some of the exercises, you can use one of those. The other thing is um, ambulatory modifications, obviously, with walkers and canes and, and, you know, any of that other stuff that you might need. Thank you, ma'am. And finally, Linda. In Tai Chi, we don't usually use any type of equipment, that is, unless we're practicing with stewards or staffs or fans. But basically how I modify is I choose the style of Tai Chi that is appropriate to the population that I'm teaching. For instance, when I started teaching the, um, the class for the Neuropathy Alliance, I said, okay, we're gonna have to take this a little slower than what I would do perhaps in a different audience. It took six weeks for me to teach them to take one step forward. That is because, not because of their limitations, but because I wanted to be sure that they could learn where their center of gravity was. You usually are standing when you're doing Tai Chi. However, if you are in a wheelchair or have really severe balance problems, you can sit in a chair. And how you would practice Tai Chi there is by moving the entire body, moving the arms, but pressing down using your glutes and your quads to power your legs and press into the feet. Different styles of Tai Chi add different things. For instance, I teach for the Neuropathy Alliance a style of Tai Chi called Tai Chi for Arthritis. Is it for arthritis? Sure, but it's for anything. A family physician developed that style based on the Sun style. When we're talking Tai Chi, we're talking families. This was developed by Sun Lu Tang. It is repetitive, it is simple, less body movement. Those types of styles are more appropriate. I also teach a Yang style. That's the one that you've seen in the arthritis drug ads. It's a little bit more rolling, a little bit more fluid motion, that sort of thing. So the different styles of Tai Chi give me tools that I can use to develop what I need to do to teach balance, to help people gain strength, and to um, develop that sense of where their gravity is. Thank you, Linda. I love those modifications. We all need to take Tai Chi, right? Yeah. No excuses for anybody. Uh, okay. So our next question is for Jenny. Uh, Jenny, do you have a success story that comes to mind where you were able to help someone overcome a personal obstacle or achieve a goal through your program? Um, I've been a physical therapist for 30 plus years and I have so many stories, I don't know that I could pick one out. What I can tell you is what I've found is the people that are successful, we work as a team, but it's 90% what they're gonna do and 10% me, okay? If you're doing these programs, you have to be committed to doing them. And that means that, you know, I, I tell patients all the time, you know, just me seeing you twice a week is not gonna work. You have to do this on your own too. You have to be part of the solution. Um, we also talk a lot about how to navigate those good days and those bad days. Okay, you're gonna have good and bad. I'm a neuropathy patient, so I know. A lot of times it's hard for me to exercise because I have those bad days. It's okay on those bad days not to exercise. It's okay to let your body rest. You have to listen to what your body's telling you. If you're hurting, you've got to let that, you've got to take care of that. Okay, you, those are the bad days and it's okay for you not to exercise. Thank you so much. And our next question is for you, Linda. How long and often does a student need to participate to start seeing benefits with your program? Studies talk about a length of time, usually 12 weeks, sometimes longer than that. What I see in my personal teaching experience, give me four weeks, give me six weeks. And here's what I tend to see. Can you bring up my slide again, the last slide? 
what happens is that people are very hesitant to move. And so it takes a little encouragement, it takes a little strength. This is a picture of the neuropathy class that I teach. If you will notice, the distance between people's feet, that is key. I talk about the difference between being a triangle, where I'm balanced with both my feet together, or being a rectangle. Everyone in this picture has a strong base. That takes strength and it takes balance. Being able to move an arm away from the center of body, that takes strength and awareness. This is a move called single whip. And th this class has been um, practicing for about two years. So they are, have come a long ways from not being able to take one step forward to being able to take more than one step, step forward, step sideways, and to step backwards. But they have to keep on doing it. This is not, oh, I'll come to class one day, I'll do it for a month, stop. Guess what? You have to keep on coming. Thank you so much, Linda. And finally, our last question is for the whole panel. This should be a, a fun question. What is your favorite part of what you do? Let's start with Julie. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not used to that. All right. No, my favorite part of what I do is seeing other people succeed in their um, health and wellness goals. Um, I love every day just, you know, we, we splash, we play, we laugh, we have fun, and we're also... Re uh, meeting all the goals for good health and, you know, addressing the mental and spiritual um, aspect of disease process. So anything you can do to delay the disease, which is a, you know, a, a method that they use um, actually in, in Parkinson's, but it's true for anything. If we can keep moving and delay the disease process by getting oxygenated blood through our systems and, um, increasing your uh, good hormones and such. <laughs> um, but basically, I'm just very passionate about teaching others and seeing them succeed and having fun in, in water. Thanks, Julie. And Jenny, your favorite part? Um, first of all, you need to know that not all physical therapists are evil. <laughs> no, they're not. And if you have an evil one, go somewhere else. Find someplace else. Um, I saw one time, and this is hysterical, a patient who came in from another, had gone to physical therapy at another place and had one of their T-shirts on. And the T-shirt said, if you're not crying, we're not trying. <laughs> I just shook my head. I was like, really? No. I was like, please don't go back to that place. I think I like to tell people that in most jobs, you can work forever and no one ever tells you you're doing a good job. I get that every day when a person comes in and says, I could dress myself today. You know, I could go up and down my stairs. I could um, cook something. I could reach up into my cabinet. That for me is the most rewarding part is that I'm helping people get their lives back, basically. I love that. <laughs> um, and Linda, your favorite part? Obviously, both of what these two ladies have said is, is part of my favorite part as well, seeing the results seeing people operate better on a daily basis. But also, it is fun. <laughs> we are in a supportive atmosphere. There is a social element to a Tai Chi class. In my, in my Tai Chi classes, members support each other. They care about each other. And also, it is a truly mind, body, spirit exercise. We think with our brain. There is the intent 
when I move my body in certain positions, I intend to move it. So my brain cannot think of anything else that I'm doing because hands are going in different direction, weight is in different directions, feet are moving. So that is why I like Tai Chi as a very comprehensive whole body exercise. Well, thank you for that, for that answer. And uh, so let's give our panel members a round of applause. And a round of applause for me because I kept us on schedule. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll start our question and answer session. Thank you. Um, and at this time, if I could invite all of the speakers from this morning as well to kind of come up, since I imagine questions will be directed to everyone and anyone. Great. So does anyone have any questions? Raise your hands. All right. Yes. Oh. <laughs> So Jenny, first to you. I've yes. found that all, uh, not all physical therapists are created equal. Thank you. In fact, I've found that, um, well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna reference an article that I've, I've read from mm -hmm. a, a periodical called Massage Today. And it was written by Rita, a girl named Rita Woods. And she talks about massage therapy for peripheral neuropathy. She also references a, a Rita, uh, no, excuse me, a, a Charlotte Versace who has written a book on protocols for mm -hmm for massage. Um, I've been to several physical therapists, and it appears to me that none of them, they all understand uh, muscles, soft tissue, and bones, but they have not a clue about nerves. Yeah. And so they go in there like McGilla Gorilla and start tearing <laughs> apart your, your joints. Yeah. And no matter what you say to them, they don't understand that. So um, in this article, one of the articles that Rita Woods wrote, she talks about a 55-year-old guy who, who was in severe pain, could barely walk, and his doctor told him that he, he should get ready for amputation. He's a diabetic peripheral neuropathy guy. And um, so, so he went, long story short, to this Charlotte Versace, and she started doing the massage therapy. She taught the wife how to do the massage therapy. She taught the guy how to do the massage therapy. So it was very frequent, twice a day. And over four months, he went from that stage of threatening to have uh, an amputation yep. to almost no pain. Yep. Now, I don't know whether this is a true story, but it's in this periodical, and uh, you know. So, uh, so how do you find a, a physical therapist? I say all that to ask the question, how do you find a physical therapist that has a clue about Massage and neuropathy. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have to do your research. You really do. You, you can ask your doctor, your neurologist. A lot of times they may have specific physical therapists that they like to work with. Um, I'm all for alternate stuff. I mean, just because I'm a physical doesn't mean I know everything. So I always advocate massage, acupuncture, you know, any of that stuff that might actually help. And what may work for you may not work for somebody else. It's unfortunately a trial and error sort of process. Um, I would just look at, do they treat neuropathy or do they treat neurological patients? Is that something they normally work with? Just like in the medical field, physical therapy, they have different specialties too. Okay, I've, I've worked in orthopedics, basically, and, neuro and neurology, with neurology patients. Um, some people might not have that expertise, so you, wanna, you really and truly want to ask them, what are your expertises? What do you normally, what kind of patient do you normally work on, basically? Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. I'd like to add to that because I am an occupational therapist um, and I was an o I've been an OT prior to becoming a driving rehab specialist. Um, I want to empower you when you call to make that appointment um, initially, ask the person who answers the phone, do you have a therapist that specializes in pain management? If they don't know what you're talking about, 
hang up and call another place. Yep. <laughs> um, and if, they, if the receptionist doesn't know what you're talking about, leave your phone number and say, I need to talk to the supervisor, the physical therapist that's in charge of that clinic. Have them call me prior to scheduling that appointment. It's within your patient rights to do that. So be an advocate for yourself. Just because that's the first person that was referred to you doesn't mean it's the best person. Right. Um, so I really empower you guys to be your own advocates and feel comfortable asking that clinic, wherever it is that you may call. And unfortunately, um, we specialize as therapists just like physicians do. Some of us specialize in orthopedics. I specialize in driving. Some specialize in pain management. So when you do call, unfortunately, not all therapy clinics are the same. So find one that works for you and use your support groups for those references as well. And if you don't feel like you're getting what you need, it's okay to go someplace else. So, so you, you go off a lot of places, and it's like you, you make an all sorts of phone calls to see people, and they all say, oh, yeah, we can, we can take care of it. Yeah. Where is, what is the certification that I, that I should be knowledgeable enough to ask if they call? Where, where is the training facility for these people to come out of? Oh, it's, there's physical therapy uh, teaching, or I'm sorry, schools all over the country. Yeah. I mean, they cover everything. It's, it's a comprehensive thing. But like we said, some people will specialize in, in one thing or the other. They're all general. They can all treat stuff. But you want somebody that has more experience doing that. Like, I have neuropathy, so I would definitely start with therapists who treat neurological patients that treat neuropathy and go from there. I'm worried. Where I am, they treat people. Yep. Yeah, right. Well, and what I usually tell my patients is give me six visits. If you're not any better after six visits, then we need to revisit. We need to figure out what's going on and, and what's better for you. I have no problem. I've had no problem referring patients out to somebody else who I knew could treat that patient better. Thank you. There's a question back here. Uh, I don't have a question, but you were talking about specialties. You mentioned neurology and orthopedics. There is another one called physical medicine and rehabilitation. Yep. 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 And if you've not ever heard of it, I didn't either until 10 years ago when I went to work for UT Dale Medical School. It wasn't even UT Dale Medical School at the time. It was Seton, and now it's Ascension. Yep. But um, <clears throat> so there, it, you can Google PM&R and that stands for physical medicine and rehabilitation. And those doctors are specifically trained uh, to deal with function. Yep. And uh, I went for a certain um, uh, issue with my knees and they sent me to a massage therapist, to a, um, a chiropractor, yep. and a physical therapist. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address what you just said just because um, my mentor was actually a um, physical medic medicine doctor. And he utilized my, I worked um, in Phoenix at the Barrows Neurological Institute ancillary. We had a pool, so all their spinal cords would come to us. So, you know, experience is the greatest teacher. I, and so we got a lot of that. And, um, you know, we just find with, and with, like you said, the um, massage. I do massage in the water. It's called aquasage. Um, I use flotation devices. So it takes the body completely weightless. Some people are comfortable being it. Most of the time, I have no problem. They'll have, I have a very small percentage of people that are fearful, but I'm a hands-on um, person. So what we do in the water is not just I'm on a deck. I'm in there doing massage, doing techniques called aqua stretch, um, vadragas. Again, there's a, that's a whole new language. If you check out aquatic therapy and rehab, you can see the many different modalities that we have just within aquatics. Thanks. I heard a reference to um, chiropractic, and also I've seen online the role of chiropractor with peripheral neuropathy. I just wonder if anybody can add any insight uh, to what a chiropractor may or can offer. 
um, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. But I will tell you that um, just like any other um, specialty, there are some good chiropractors and there's some not so good ones, okay? If you need something truly adjusted, if something is going to help you to adjust that area or that joint, you should not have to go three times a week for six weeks, okay? Because then you're, you're damaging tissue, you're damaging that joint. If you truly need something adjusted, they should be able to adjust you after a couple of visits and then show you how to maintain that is the only thing I would tell you about that. Now, do I know the success rate for that? No. I have no clue. That would be a thing that you'd want to research. You'd want to look online and see if there's any research specific to the efficacy of chiropractic with neuropathy, basically. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, go right ahead. I've used the chiropractor as kind of a coach. I've used the chiropractor as kind of a coach. He he has he has a lot of uh, education in neuropathy, and he's a guy. He's a doctor who will talk to you, yeah. as opposed to the socialized medicine where if the doctor hasn't figured out in eight minutes what's wrong with you, you're toast. Get out of here and come back in five weeks. So that's the way I've used the chiropractor as a coach. Has it helped? Yes. See, there you go. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, exactly. Um, actually, it's not a question. I want to share something that, as a neuropathy patient myself, uh, for three years, what I've tried uh, physical therapy helped greatly. I've tried acupuncture, it helped also. Uh, but two additional things I would like to share with my fellow patients is um, I couldn't walk for longer than two and a half minutes at a time. And so what I did is uh, all those things, I couldn't drive, I could not walk. So most of the time I had to do things at home. So what helped me was um, get up and walk how many other steps I can. So if it is 250 steps at a time, I did that. And by the end of the day, I had a target of 10,000 steps. And it took maybe three months for me to come, uh, you know, uh, ramp up. But that helped me uh, deal with the pain. Uh, the, sec the additional one I also tried, this is also trial and error, just like you were saying. Yeah. No one told me, yeah. but I've tried Pilates reformer, and that stretches. And after uh, trying for two to three months, at least three times, and I could barely do 10% of the uh, Pilates. I, I want to be honest with you all. But those two things changed my life, and the pain has subsided, and it is in control. So that's something that we can consider if your doctor says okay and if you are willing. Thank you. You, you made a good point that you couldn't walk. So one of the things you did was actually walk as your exercise, okay? That's the best way to do, especially at home. Um, if you are having a hard time going up and down steps, if you can only go one step at a time, then start on that lower step and just work on that, okay? If you're having trouble reaching up in the cabinet, you don't have to have a weight or anything. Just doing that motion, you're working those muscles, you're working those joints. So you don't have to have any special equipment. If you have a problem with certain aspects of your function, just doing that over and over and over again will help. Question in the back. I want to thank you for offering your experience, and I want to add to that. Um, I haven't heard a lot about nutrition. And just for some context, my husband has CIDP, and I went to his neurologist because of some severe nerve pain in my ankle and said, what's going on? She did EMG and all sorts of stuff. Uh, she told me I have axonal motosensory neuropathy, I think was the right term. But at any rate, uh, in the course of my husband looking for some relief, in addition to IVIG, 
we saw an acupuncturist, a chiropractor, uh, and a nutritionist. And uh, a doctor put us on a Mediterranean-style diet. It isn't strictly Mediterranean, but, but pretty much uh, you can, there's a great book that everything anti-inflammation diet book or something. Uh, so we got that, we did some reading, we strictly adhered to that diet for four months. Brain fog lifted, which we weren't expecting, but that was wonderful. We lost 40 pounds each. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, and symptoms subsided. I think this one. Oh. Um, but when I went to the neurologist and said, I've got awful burning pain, she said, to take some meth B complex and acid. And I did, and within two or three weeks, that pain is essentially gone. So I would just encourage you to put nutrition into the mix. Yes, thank you. Another question over here. I actually don't have a question. I'm gonna call my husband out because he's here. <laughs> <laughs> he's occupied right now. He has. Neuropathy as a what side effect of amyloidosis. And I used to tell him all the time, exercise. If blood's not flowing to your hands and your feet, exercise. But of course, you know how that goes. <laughs> and he would move so slow just around the house and he would be so tired. I'm an exercise person. And I would just say, come to the gym and just walk on the treadmill. Just put one foot in front of the other. And it wasn't until he got into an exercise program ordained by the doctor for physical therapy that he really started breathing better and moving better. And I'm here to say that he looks good. He looks really, really good. So I'm, I'm calling him out to say, <laughs> keep going, <laughs> keep moving. And we have a gym across from where we live that does what you're saying, that does what you're saying. So I'm saying, get to the gym, <laughs> get to the gym because it really, really works. Exercise really works. And take it as an adventure. You know, you're trying something new. You're getting out of your box. I'm up here. I'm not a public speaker, obviously. You know, I'm getting out, got out of my box. You know, I got out of the swimming pool for you. <laughs> and I would like to also address that. Find something that interests you. Find a group find a gym. I have uh, one of my Tai Chi students, her husband has uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. He found a boxing class. He is a Marine, ex-Marine. He found a class that is very supportive and works with his abilities to help him. He has some balance issues and he has some um, other uh, symptoms. Of, of imbalance, and they don't know exactly where it's all coming from, but he found something that fit for him. So what you, what you helped him do was to find something that's good and that people want to have continued contact with. And I think for my Tai Chi students, let's see, I think Susan is a long time student. How long have you been coming to class, Susan? Five years, okay? That's what it takes. Mary's been in my class for two years. I think Irma's been about three years now. And so it takes having a support group around you, whatever environment that is, to find something that works and to keep at it. Like I said, it's not just one time, okay, I'm gonna to go to the gym on Friday and that's gonna be it because that's gonna fix my issues. No, I gotta go back and I gotta return. Yeah. And one of the reasons that I, can, I wanted to teach Tai Chi, the 90 year olds are the cover girls on the Tai Chi magazine and I have a lot to learn before I can become the cover girl on the Tai Chi magazine. <laughs> Uh, 
<clears throat> and I also want to add that um, in the water, I have, we, we can take anything that you do on land and put it in the water. I use golf clubs, I use tennis rackets, I have a step trainer, so if steps are difficult, then we work on, you know, you, you want to hone in on the, the parts of the body that are functional and operational that you can strengthen, and so we do that, we just make it fun and adapt it. I always ask, what's your hobbies, what former sports or interests have you had, and we're going to find something. And we do boxing in the water, and we have the boxing in Georgetown, and it's fabulous. I've had, I, you know, I work very closely with the Parkinson support group, and um, the boxing has been a wonderful thing for these people. And then, you know, we took it to light, or took it to water, and so they can do it, you know, in two different environments. So, and one follow up to that, I endorse both the physical therapy and the water training. When I was competing in competitions, I would go to my health club pool to practice my kicks. Because in water, yes, you are about 30% of your weight, but also you are fighting against currents and other swimmers in the water, so you're fighting for that balance. So I practice my kicks in water. And just recently, a new student came to class and she said, well, I just came from my doctor and I was asking for physical therapy because she's 85 years old, I'm afraid of falling. She may not have had neuropathy, but she had generalized weakness and looking at her, her gait really put her in danger of tipping forward. And she said her doctor told her, well, just go to the Tai Chi class and that will do you. And I went, nope, if you go to the physical therapist, you're going to get at least two visits a week there, plus you're going to get me for another hour. And that all adds up. It is cumulative. Everything you do on a daily basis, getting up out of bed, going down the hallway and walking, going to your gym, going to the physical therapist, coming to water aerobics or to uh, Tai Chi classes. It all counts. I think we've got a question here. Yeah, we have time for well, just a couple a question, more questions. But I, let, I've been oh. waiting. I want to say something. I want to reinforce what the lady said about nutrition. Uh, everybody's different. Mine came about from eating too much sugar, drinking too much alcohol. <laughs> I'm a sugarholic, not an alcoholic. But I found that a modified keto diet pretty much makes mine go away. Mm. And so it's very important. And something I hit on that was just crazy. So I ate some chips that had cassava in them, which is something I know as yucca. My feet went on fire. And so I looked it up. And it's a plant that is poisonous unless it's processed correctly. And I think when they process it so it doesn't kill you, they leave some of the stuff in it. <laughs> and I reacted to that. And then I read further that it's a chronic mild fighting uh, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy among people in Africa who eat a lot of cassava. So my tip is look at the label and don't eat cassava. If it burns your feet, you know why. Right. Thank you. Okay, I think, did you still have a question over here? Okay, great. <clears throat> and we'll probably have time for maybe one more question after this. Okay, my, my comment is don't discount somebody if they're in a wheelchair Absolutely. because they can, just because maybe their legs don't work, their brain still works. I asked for a tricycle for Christmas. I got a tricycle. I used my tricycle to ride to and from my apartment a mile and a half to the pharmacy to pick up my prescription, I go through the drive-in window, I get my prescription, I ride home. So that is that is my one. And that's so important that the you know the aid with the ADA regulations that you're able to move around and go do anything. I mean, swimming pools included. We have lift chairs, we have ramps, we have in-water wheelchairs. <clears throat> um, so you don't use your own wheelchair to get wet. Um, and working with uh, paraplegics and quadriplegics, you know, 
it's whatever you do. And, and they always say um, necessity is the mother of invention. And it's amazing what each and every one of you probably do on a daily basis just to make your life simpler, more adapted, and you know, communicating with each other and your success stories is, is really healing and helpful to everybody and to us to, to help you. Great. One last question in the back. Yeah, I, I just want to agree with the nutrition part. I, I, it's helped me a lot. But 10 years ago, I walked into the gym to get more exercise because I, I knew it was, it was getting worse. You know, I've, been, I've been dealing with neuropathy probably for nearly 50 years, so it's been a long time. Uh, but when I walked into the gym, somebody saw me walking around the gym and maybe picking up the ball, and shooting at the hoops, and somebody said, why don't you join our volleyball team? Uh, I said, well, yeah, I'm not a volleyball player or a basketball player or anything, but I need some exercise. Uh, Ten years I've been playing basketball now. It's helped me a lot through the National Senior Games Association. This June, my team from Chicago, that's the team I play with, won a national championship. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's taken a lot of work, but let me tell you about my team. You know, I have neuropathy. We had a member who had brain aneurysm. We had another player who had Parkinson's disease. We had another player that had uh, Alzheimer's. Another player, I mean, on and on. Everybody had something, and what makes it unique is it's a level playing field. We're all the same age, basically all in our 70s. We all have some sort of impairment or disability, and yet the motivation is there for all of us because each one of us is lifting each other up. And it gives us a target every month, every season, we play year-round. I travel around the country now playing tournaments. Uh, we won the World Games a couple years ago. So it's given me the motivation. Some people may say, well, that's pretty hard on your body. Well, you move as much as you can. It is somewhat adapted, but you move as much as you can, and you don't get old unless you stop playing, and we're going to continue playing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Which reminds me, we've, we're actually featuring um, Dana in an upcoming newsletter um, with the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy. It's going to be hitting homes in October, and it goes out to all of our members, people who support us on an annual basis of $30 or more. So if you're interested in reading about her story, getting the latest information on research and other tips, I know we're actually featuring an article from Megan in that newsletter as well. So um, I'd encourage you to, to read out to me or Nancy, visit our website. It's listed up here, um, foundationforpn.org. Um, so it's a great way. We have a wealth of information. Um, and similarly, it's an opportunity for you to support our mission um, and help us continue programs like this, which in closing, I really hope that you found helpful. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of the questions. I know there were still a few more hands in the room. I apologize, but we ran out of time. That being said, I know that many of the panelists and the speakers that are still here would be more than happy to stay and chat for a little bit before the luncheon starts. And for those that are watching on live stream, if we weren't able to answer some of the questions you have, just feel free to send us an email. Um, our email address is info, which is short for information, info at tff pn.org, um, and we'd be more than happy to answer any of those questions. So just because the event is stopping right now doesn't mean that we are stopping. So um, truly reach out to any of us. Um, we're more than happy to help. Come stay, come find me after this event as well if you're in the room. Um, thank you again for coming. We welcome your feedback, both positive and, I don't say negative, but room for improvement. So if there's something that you found that you really enjoyed or th thinking that we could improve for our next event, um, please tell me. I really do welcome that. And um, lastly, just want to thank you again for coming. Um, thank you to our sponsors, El Nylum, Regenesis, and Parafax for supporting us in this event. We couldn't have done it without them either. And we couldn't do it without you. You guys are the reasons why we're here. Thank you to all of our speakers. And um, have a good rest of your day. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.